You're looking at a live shot of the skyline of Cleveland, Ohio on Light Up Cleveland Night. They're very proud, the powers of be of the city, of the urban renewal that has transpired over the past few years, and they're showing it off tonight on the occasion of our game between the Cincinnati Bengals and the Cleveland Browns. And tonight, you'll see it live, the AFC Central Division champion Browns against the Bengals in a special presentation of ABC's NFL of football. This ABC Sports exclusive is brought to you by Ford and your local Ford dealer who invites you to see the 1986 Ford cars and trucks. Have you driven a Ford lately? By Miller Lite for great taste. There's only one light beer by McDonald's. It's a good time for the great taste of McDonald's and by Kellogg's all brand cereal. Hello again, everyone. I'm Frank Gifford. And if you think you've been watching a lot of football lately, you have been watching a lot of football lately. Monday, Thursday, Monday, Thursday, Monday. We think we're in Cleveland for Cincinnati, but we know we'll be in Green Bay for the Bears on Monday night. And while you've been watching it, we've been traveling to these various cities. And tonight we think we have a real good guard for you, the Cleveland Browns, the Central Division champions of a year ago, albeit with an 8-8 eight eight record against the Cincinnati Bengals, a young team on the way up. The two teams, perhaps the power of the Central Division here in the AFC. And the Cleveland Browns, their defense has started to come together. Chip Banks came in late, the great linebacker. Ray Ellis is opening it, strong safety, a former Philadelphia Eagle. They've only had him a couple of weeks, but they are starting to come together and they feel that now it is the Cleveland Browns defense that they anticipated they would have. But on offense, that is where they are looking to see great things from a youngster out of the University of Miami who should still be playing his senior year of football there. There he is, Bernie Kozar, six foot five, and he may perhaps really came together against Chicago in the opener a couple of weeks ago. And he was patient against Houston last week when he finally found a man on the blitz, a speedster named Reggie Langhorn. He waited and waited, and he finally hit him, and the Cleveland Browns came from behind to win that one. And there is always Ozzie Newsom, number 82, the most prolific receiver in the game of football over the past five years. So Bernie Kozar has some fine people to work with. Should be a good football game. And when we think of offense, you think of the Cincinnati Bengals, Al. And they have a funny way of unleashing it, however. They, their coach, Sam Wash, has a funny kind of attack. The irony here is that the Bengals are so potent, they in their own way and own right could be lighting up Cleveland tonight, lighting up the scoreboard. Anyway, if you have not seen the Cincinnati Bengals in a while, they are a very potent offensive team with some different twists. They have things like the sideline huddle and the split huddle and also what they call the fast break. We'll develop that as the telecast moves along. In a way, they remind you of a track team or a basketball team, and they very much remind you of the San Diego Chargers in the sense they score a lot of points, but the big question is defense. Now, they do have the tools to make it work offensively with all of the twists and the innovations under third-year coach Sam White. They have a great young quarterback. They talk about Bernie Kozar in Cleveland. Well, the answer in Cincinnati is the left-hander Boomer Esiason out of the University of Maryland. Up-and-coming quarterback who has James Brooks coming out of the backfield, and he has Chris Collinsworth and Eddie Brown and people like that. And the Bengals are a team capable of putting 30 or 40 points on the board on any given day or night. A case in point would be on Sunday when they went into overtime to beat the Buffalo Bills 36 to 33. But the big question in Cincinnati is defense. If they get a decent defensive performance this season, well, this division is up for grabs. It will probably only take nine or ten wins at most to win the AFC Central, and these two teams could very well be the cream of the crop in the AFC Central, where we know Pittsburgh has problems, where we know Houston is improving, but whether they'll contend all the way or not is a question. The Browns are the defending AFC Central champs, and the Cincinnati Bengals come off a season in which they were 7 and 9. Matt Barr, the average start after he has kicked off this season for the opposition, has been the 31 yard line. And just to put that in perspective, the average last year was the 24-yard line for the opposition. So what it tells you is that they've been running back kicks off bar thus far this year, including Dennis Gentry's run back on opening day for Chicago. It's fielded by Tim McGee, the rookie wide receiver, and he takes it out to the 18-yard line. And the crowd fired up immediately. For the Browns, their home opener, and the first time they have been here at Cleveland Stadium since the first game of the exhibition season. So it's been six weeks since they played a game here. And here come the Bengals. They were huddled on the sideline that time with Sam White, and now they come out as an 11-man unit and start without the huddle. With Boomer Esiason, number seven, the quarterback. James Brooks and Larry Kinnebrew, the running backs. Brooks, 21, and Kinnebrew, the big man, 28. And it's Brooks on a sweep, looking for a block. 
moving to the outside and out of bounds at the 20-yard line. So Brooks gains only two, and it'll be second down and eight. Eddie Johnson ran him out of bounds. As we look at the Cleveland defense, we may point out that the Cincinnati Bengals will run from the different types of huddle. They'll stand at the line of scrimmage. They call it a split huddle. They use that about 40% of the time. Right now, they're in what you would characterize as a regulation huddle. They have an attack huddle. They mostly use that on the third down where they call the play at the line of scrimmage. And what you are seeing right now is the split huddle. The offensive line comes up, and then the backs and receivers come up very quickly, try to catch the defense before they are set, and they go very quickly with it. And on second and eight, play action on a roll by Esiason, and the lefty throws complete for a first down to Rodney Holman, the tight end, running a sideline route. Holman, the five-year tight end out of Tulane, and already this season in the two games, he's caught ten passes. That was an example of their split huddle. The offensive line comes up first to the line of scrimmage. Play called in the huddle. And then the wide receivers and setbacks will deploy. There you see the offensive line up to the line of scrimmage. Now the receivers, the setbacks, they'll move quickly and they usually snap the ball very quickly before the defense can adjust. Collinsworth and Brown, meanwhile, are both split to the right side. And the big man, Kinnebrew is stopped by Griggs after a gain of a couple. Kinnebrew, their leading ball carrier through the first two games this season. In your program, he's listed at 258. Last year, he got up into the 270s, so it's pretty much a day-to-day -day proposition. But they want to see him in the 250s at the most, and preferably down around 245. The split huddle once again. Second down at about six. Here come the backs and receivers. Does it bother the Browns? Marty Schottenheimer says they used it last year. It didn't affect us one way or the other. With Brown to the left and Collinsworth to the right, Esiason for Brown. And he's out of bounds at the 29-yard line. He made the catch, but he was out of bounds, and he was covered by hand prediction on the play. They are going to be dueling all night, these wide receivers, and they have great speed. This is Eddie Brown, second year out of Miami, working against Hanford Dixon. Now, Hanford Dixon is about 5'10". The other cornerback is Frank Menefield. He is 5'9". Keep in mind that Chris Collingsworth, a great wide receiver, is 6'5". But these two wide cornerbacks, they love to play man-to-man -man defense. They're very aggressive. They don't like to play a zone. They'll be good matchups to watch tonight. Third down and six at the 38 for Cincinnati. Opening drive of the game. Esaias and under pressure forced to throw in a hurry and incomplete. Intended for Mike Martin and he was covered by Manyfield. And so the crowd responds because they know that Cincinnati has to putt and Cleveland's offensive unit will be coming in. Timing pass. Manyfield is five foot nine. Mike Martin not much taller, but they know they can get it over, or at least they think they can. Menefield within good position. That ball, however, could have been caught. Tough little cookie on that left corner, as is Hanford Dixon over the right side. Jeff Hayes, who spent four seasons with Washington, and that's the man they call the ice cube, Gerald McNeil, at 5'7 and 146 pounds. Played in the USFL. Hayes comes down with a high snap, and it's a very short kick. And it takes a sideways bounce and is down to the 34-yard line. So not a good pick for Hayes, who's been having his problems in his brief Bengal career as the successor to Pat McAnally. Cleveland has the ball when we come back. Years of age, Sam White, a quarterback by trade, who once played with the Bengals back in 1970, the merger year, at the age of 41, with a mark of 16 and 18, and trying to lead this team to its second victory in three games. And Marty Schottenheimer, who is 43 years old, he would be the fourth youngest coach in the league. He took over for Sam Rotigliano in the middle of the 1984 season, took the team to the playoffs last year with an 8-8 eight eight regular season mark, and they come in tonight 1-1. One one. So Cleveland, first and 10 from the 34, and Bernie Kozar swings it out to the tight end, Newsom and Newsom takes it out to the 46-yard line and a first down. And so Kozar goes up top on the very first play. Bernie Kozar, 
And tonight he'll be operating, we know, with Ernest Biner, and we'll have to see about Kevin Mack, who is listed right there for the moment. But Mack's been bothered by a sore shoulder, and Fontenot is in at the moment. Herman Fontenot, number 28. So Mack is a question mark as Biner lines up with Fontenot in a split back set at the 47 yard line on first down. Kozar keeps his backs in for protection and then throws very short. Ozzie Newsom was down in the area and it'll be second down and 10. And here are the Bengals defensively. And again, this is their big question mark. The man in the middle is one of the emerging stars in the league. Number 69, the nose tackle Tim Crumry, fourth year out of Wisconsin. Xander had the interception in overtime that led to the winning field goal last Sunday. And the corners, Breeden, the longtime veteran, and Billups, a rookie. They have two rookies in the secondary, Billups and the strong safety, Filcher. And during the course of the evening, Al, they may have four rookies in that defensive lineup. On second down, they give it to Biner, and he goes nowhere. And it will be third down and ten. They are going to play a young rookie, Joe Kelly, the first-round draft pick out of Washington. A great deal tonight, or they plan to. When they go to four down linemen, they'll bring in Jim Scow, another rookie from Nebraska. And a couple of those with Lewis Phillips, the cornerback you mentioned, and David Fulcher. Third down you have potential to have four rookies in there at one time. If you absorb those numbers on Ernest Biner, you noted a 2.2 average on 34 carries through the first two games. So the Browns having trouble on the ground at the outset of the season. They could use Mack. On third down, Kozar steps up, shoots one across the middle, but he's shy of the first down at the 45-yard line of Cincinnati. That's Reggie Langhorn. But Langhorn comes up about a yard and a half shy of the first as Reggie Williams, the 11-year man out of Dartmouth, the linebacker, makes the stop. And as Kozar and Schottenheimer from the side take a look, they're not going to gamble this early in the game with fourth and a yard and a half, and Jeff Gossett comes in. And as they drop back to punch, you again saw the pressure Cincinnati was able to bring against Kozar. Now, Kozar is not a nifty quarterback. He does not move around quickly back there, and you do have to protect him. That time they rushed the pass, and he had to underthrow the first down. Jeff Gossett, who would be the emergency quarterback as well as the number one punter, with Martin dropping back. And it bounces into the end zone, and it's a break for Cincinnati because for Cleveland, number 48, Dee Dee Hoggard was right there. But the ball bounced wickedly away from him with a touchback, and the Bengals will take over at the 20 when we come back with no score. The Green Bay Packers, they'll need the big plays. It's ABC's NFL Monday Night Football. That first half of the season record of the Bengals has almost been bizarre for those periods of years. Meanwhile, you're looking at the Bengals. They have huddled over in the sidelines. They call it their sideline huddle. They want Cleveland to bring out their entire defense, get them deployed. They'll know what the Cleveland Browns will have defensively on the field. They call the play. They come in from the sidelines. Is it effective? Again, Marty Schottenheimer says it doesn't bother us a bit. They can huddle wherever they want to. First and 10, and Tim McGee, the rookie, goes in motion. The rookie from Tennessee, the speedy wide receiver, as Brooks cuts it back inside and takes it out to the 27-yard line. Brooks out of Auburn, and his story has been well chronicled. He played in the same backfield with Joe Cribbs and William Andrews in college. Then he went to San Diego, played with the Chargers for three years, was traded to Cincinnati straight up for Pete Johnson, had a so-so first year, but a good second season with Cincinnati, and they're banking on him. Great back. He can do so many things, and now, once again, we're looking at the split huddle. And... The best laid plans, yeah. etc. <laughs> Go array. <laughs> <laughs> Quarterback Boomer Esiason. And pretty embarrassing in a way. They're trying to trick the defense, and all of a sudden you've got to take a timeout yourself. Let's talk a little bit about it. That is a split huddle where they send the offensive line up to the line of scrimmage. They call the play, then the backs and receivers come flying up. They try to get it off before the defense can adjust. They have what they call the attack huddle. And that is everyone will be at the line of scrimmage. They say attack, attack, and then Boomer Siason will call something like, well, it could be uh, something like wing right, hum short, 88 dog zebra. That's the play. Then he gives you a series of numbers, 24, 35. Now, there is a live snap number for each game. If it's the third number, they would go on three. And then they have another 
thing called a fast break. Meanwhile, we'll take a look at a trade, Frank, that was made today, and Jim Everett, who had held out and had refused to sign with Houston, his rights traded to the Los Angeles Rams today. And meanwhile, Ken Hill, no stranger to the Pro Bowl, and the defensive end, William Fuller, and number one draft choices in the next two seasons, along with the number five pick, an 87, going to the Oilers, so that the Rams, who have Bartkowski playing at the moment, and Brock on injured reserve, they have the opportunity now to sign Jim Everett. They had to give up so much. San Francisco, I understand, also was interested in uh, Everett. But that's an awful lot to give up, and it might tell you something about what they think about Bartkowski with them at the moment. We'll get back to the Cincinnati huddle situation just shortly. Second down and three as Esiason gives the ball to Kinnebrew, and Kinnebrew picks up about a yard and a half. He made a little something out of next to nothing as he followed Bruce Kazerski in there, and he was stopped by Eddie Johnson and Anthony Griggs. So the huge fullback takes it out to the 28, third down and a short two. And the one more huddle that Cincinnati uses is what they call a fast break, and that's where everyone lines up the line of scrimmage, and they have four or five plays memorized with just word names like Geronimo. That tells them the play, the snap number, et cetera. Third down and two, and they give it to Brooks for a first down it out past the 40 to the 50 yard line and he's run out of bounds by hand for Dixon and his pushing and shoving and the rest of it but a first down as Rodney Holman was the man who sprung the block to get Brooks loose Brooks can do it all great as a receiver out of the backfield they'll line him up as a wing back but you don't mind running him either potential every year for the 2,000 yard season a combined yardage sees nothing inside puts it onto the outside and you kind of like it there's a running back who doesn't take it out of bounds. He got two or three more out of it. Dixon coming back into the play. First and ten for Cincinnati. The fake to Kennebrew. And fired and caught at the 31-yard line by Chris Collinsworth, who is then pushed back, but they'll give him forward progress to the 32. So Chris Collinsworth who's caught 10 balls in the first two weeks, and that makes it 11 now for the season. Covered on the play. By a 5'9", Frank Minifield. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think we're going to see a lot of that this evening, particularly if Esaias can be assured of getting this kind of coverage, and that is individual coverage. I have to come up there, read the defense, and try and pick the receiver that's going to be single coverage. That time, it was Collinsworth. And Minifield gives away 8 inches as Collinsworth at 6 feet 5 out of the game at the moment. And the pitch goes to Kennebrew. Kennebrew fighting and bullying, and Kennebrew turns it into a decent game to the 25. You know how we talked about all those huddles, all the finesse of the Cincinnati Bengals. There are a lot of people in this game who wonder why go to the trouble. You have one of the great offensive units put together with Chris Collinsworth on one side, the speech to Eddie Brown on the other. You just saw Kennebrew. We saw Collinsworth. A moment ago, we saw Kennebrew. We saw Brooks break off a big gainer. You have a great offensive line. They're huge. Remington in the middle. Anthony Muniz, the left tackle. Why put the burden on them to go through this kind of an offensive set? Of course, Sam White says it doesn't trouble them. But I have to question whether or not it isn't kind of overloading the circuits. Second down and three. At the 25-yard line, the fake pitch and the flag. And let's see if they had taken too much time. Well, wait. Jerry Markbright is the official. Ball start, number 65, offense, second down. Max Montoya turning a second down and three into a second down and eight. It's a good point you bring up, Frank, about overloading the circuits, and you wonder if it was a, an innovation to the extent that it was so revolutionary as to turn the Bengals into a much better team. You would think that other coaches would be beginning to copy it, but you're not seeing anybody else doing this right now. Something is similar even is, well, the two-minute drill. With some teams, they call everything by number and name at the line of scrimmage. But this has not been copied around the league. Brown is in motion on second down and eight. And Esaias, it looks for Brown and hits him. And Brown has the first down. He gets 
Harris inside the 20 and down the sidelines and out of bounds he goes at about the eight yard line covered by Frank Minifield. And so this impressive drive continues on. It'll be first down and goal. Eddie Brown working against the Minifield and Minifield has got to respect the speed of Eddie Brown. Everybody is well aware that he can fly. And Minifield, you see, way out of the picture. And he had Eddie Brown man for man. There he is getting back in the picture. He'll, he'll rough up Brown when they get out of bounds. But there is a lot of feeling between these two teams, particularly at the management level, with, with Art Brown, who in his second year as owner of the Cleveland Browns 24 years ago, fired Paul Brown, the legendary fire Paul Brown, who later founded these Bengals. On first and goal, Esiason pump fakes, throws, and has it picked off inside the five-yard line by Hanford Dixon. He pump faked to Brown and then tried to hit him again, and Dixon was right there to foil it. And so the Bengals marching methodically down the field, and Esiason right on target, and then on first and goal, the intercept, and back come the Browns now. Both backs going right. You get single coverage, and it almost looked as if Esiason did not even see Dixon. He was inside, but when you're down there close, you can play it inside. You play your man much tighter. You don't play him deep. You play just about level with him. That's where Dixon was. It was almost like Esiason did not even see him. On Sunday, Dixon had an interception, a fumble recovery, and six tackles against Houston. And on Thursday, a big interception early on as the Browns take over at their own seven-yard line, first and ten. Mm, that hurts an offensive team. Good drive they had going. And they have Curtis Dickey in the game, and Dickey, operating from the tailback spot, takes it out to the eight-yard line. Another look right there at Hanford Dixon, who's given the Browns possession. The thing I'm wondering about, Frank, right now with Dickey in the game, they wanted to see how Mack responded to the pregame drills, and I wonder if Dickey being in there right now is the tip-off that we won't see Kevin Mack tonight. Hard to speculate, but Marty Schottenheimer told you exactly what he told me, that they were going to look first, and if not, we would see a lot of Dickey tonight, who had his great years, of course, with the Baltimore Colts before coming last year. He can do it all. He's healthy, and not only a good runner, but a good receiver. That's Biner going nowhere and frustrated about it, pounding the grass, and it's third down and eight upcoming. They've had problems with the clock here, but it seems to be operating at the moment, at least what it's saying is 640 to go in the period. Interesting, the Bengals who have given up so much yardage in their first two games on the ground, the very, they've had the worst record in the league in the first two games. They have shut off the Cleveland running game, and if they can force the third down into fourth down, they are going to get the football back in good field position. They said Webster Slaughter wide to the left and Reggie Langhorn is wide to the right. On third down and eight with Brennan also sent into the pattern from the slot and the pass is dropped by Brennan. Brian Brennan, who was their leading wide receiver in terms of catches last year. Kozar was hammered after he released the ball. The Bengals bringing two outside linebackers and they got to him. He had time to get rid of the football and it was a pass that Probably should have been caught by Brennan, who is usually sure-handed. But as I mentioned a moment ago, the Bengals tough on defense, and they should get the ball back close to midfield. So Gossett in his end zone to kick it away. Mike Martin fields the short kick at the Browns 45. And it's a 12-yard run back as he takes it to the 33-yard line. And so Cincinnati in good shape with six minutes and one second to play in the first period at Cleveland. The Bengals and the Browns are scoreless. And Frank Gifford with you from Cleveland where the Cincinnati Bengals have the football at the Cleveland 33-yard line. That's their variation of the sideline huddle. We've been talking about the different huddles they use. They use this during television timeouts, basically, as was the case here. Well, we've created... Havoc with this game, haven't we? And basketball. <laughs> <laughs> Pays a few salaries, though, doesn't it? <laughs> As they come right out, line up. They know what the Browns are going to use in terms of personnel. Call the play from the sideline. Here we go. First down from the 33-yard line, and it's Brooks who gets stripped up on a nice play by Chip Banks, who held out. Banks wanted all sorts of guarantees in his contract. Initially, he began to talk about things like not being taken out of the game on third down plays. 
There's Brooks again. Banks is one of the fine linebackers you'll ever find in this game. He missed almost all of the training camp. And he is one of those pieces that Marty Schottenheimer says is now starting to come together. He's had several players playing in different positions. They are now starting to mature defensively, however. Esiason with a lot of time, but then he's wrapped up and in the grasp at the 42-yard line, Sam Clancy. And the Browns in their first two-plus games have had only two sacks and both of them by that man. Sam Clancy, number 91. Former USFL are at Memphis, and he is the designated pass rusher now for the Cleveland Browns. And I'll tell you, that's a good move. Clancy is 260 pounds. He's six foot seven. Esiason is not all that athletic back there, but he has a knack of slipping tackles, and that time Clancy zeroed in on him, lined his eyes up with the belt, and he made a difficult open field tackle from loss way back to the 42-yard line. That take him out of field goal range. Third down and 19 with four wide receivers in the game. Siasen sending everybody, including Brooks, into the pattern, and he throws to the ground. The ground is hit at the 32-yard line, well shy of the first down. It'll be fourth and nine, but they're back now within field goal range. Chris Rockins and Frank Minifield in on the tackle, and so they can bring in Jim Breach, who started his career with the Oakland Raiders in '79. And he's been with Cincinnati since 80, and he's been one of the more consistent kickers in the league, and he's coming off a game-winning field goal in overtime. This will, this will be a 49-yard attempt. And it's right on the edge for Jim Breach. Very strong and very accurate at 45 yards. Beyond that, it's reaching a little bit. And he has hit from way back earlier in his career. Ken Anderson oh, to yes. hold, and the kick is no good. And one official initially I thought had signaled no good and then says good. It appeared as if the one official was about ready to signal that it was no good, but it just did make it into the corner. Take another look at this one. He whacked it good. That's a good kick for Jim Breach. Splits it perfectly. And Cincinnati gets something on oh, their drive. Watch the man lower left. Mm -hmm. Left, and you can see why I initially called this no good. It's good, but then watch him. <laughs> looks like oh. Greg, looks like Greg Luganis. Whoop! <laughs> With about a five-six, right into the corner, just inside the upright, and three nothing from 49 yards for Jim Breach as Gerald McNeil is back to receive at the goal line and Breach to kick off for Cincinnati. McNeil weighs 137 pounds, hard to believe, and yet he's a one tough little cookie. Kicks it into the corner, and Reggie Langhorn, who scored. The big touchdown against Houston. The wide receiver runs this one back to the 24-yard line. And it'll be first and 10 for the Browns at that spot. So Bernie Kozar coming out. The Browns with Kozar figuring to be number one this season when they went to camp. But keep in mind, too, that Gary Danielson had recovered and had rehabilitated from rotator cuff surgery and he appeared to be ready and then all of a sudden in preseason Danielson with a broken ankle and probably gone for the year. So there was never any question at that point as to who would be number one. Kozar to Biner and Biner is taken down at the 31 yard line after a gain of about seven Emmanuel King the linebacker in on the tackle. And the Bengals bringing the blitz to Kozar, and he read it quickly, and he went to the man he knew would be available, and that was Biner out of the backfield. Uh, what they like about Kozar is how quickly, and he's certainly a bright young man, there's no question about that, but how quickly he is adapting to this game. He's young, he's 22, but he's, he's in tough inside. He is indeed that, and more than that, he's beginning to read things much more quickly. That's Biner and Dickey, with Biner leading the way for the tailback. Dickey, and Curtis taking it out past the 35 for a first down. And now when you mentioned that Gary Danielson went down with a broken ankle in the final preseason game, it left Bernie first Kozar first kind of out there first hanging first because first Gary first. Danielson was a great help to Kozar all through last year. The veteran brought in from the Detroit Lions. 
and it was expected that he might even have been the starter this year. Well, when he went down, it was all on Kozar's shoulders, and he has reacted, as I mentioned earlier. He played well in Chicago. He played well last week against Houston, and there's nothing but, I think, greatness ahead for him. They're going with two quarterbacks. The other is Pago. First down, and Kozar is hit as he gets rid of it on the blitz by number 91, Carl Zander, the second-year linebacker out of Tennessee, forcing the issue, and it's second down and 10. And this is what you do when you get a young quarterback. You keep going until he proves that he can deal with it. Actually, he had no shot. Zander dealing, coming around the horn, as you would say, and wide open, got right to Kozar, had his arm in motion, saved the interception and saved the sack. But you pay the price for it when you get nailed like that. So Reggie Langhorn is split to the left, and Webster Slaughter out of San Diego State to the right, the rookie. Here they come again. And the pass is incomplete, intended for Ozzie Newsom, covered by Ray Horton on the play. And it'll be third down and 10. That's what Cincinnati, and they're not noted for a lot of blitzing. They're going to do that to Kozar all night until he starts to hurt them and start to beat them. First of all, the pressure's on Kozar. The defensive backs can cover the receivers so much more tightly. Xander once again in there. But Kozar couldn't hold it. He had to let it go, and the defensive backs know that. It was Ozzie Newsom, the intended receiver, but Ray Horton, the nickelback, knew that there was going to be pressure on Kozar. He could play Newsom very tight. And he originally looked the way of Webster Slaughter, who never got off the line as he was hit by Lewis Breeze. That took him out of the play. Third down and ten. And it's dumped off a short, complete pass for no gain to Herman Fontenot. Again, the pressure. Kozar. Again, trying to look downfield. He just didn't have the time to do it. And you're looking at a Cincinnati defense that was 22nd in the NFL last year. They were 24th against the pass. And Marty Schottenheimer has to be wondering, how can I get something happening? You should be able to take advantage of the blitz. But first of all, you've got to pick it up. Jeff Gossett to kick. And Martin fields on a bounce from the 18-yard line. And runs it back to the 21 with 2.04 to play in the first quarter. Cincinnati on top, 3 0 after a 46 yard kick and a two yard return. Monday will be in Green Bay where the Packers try to get on track against the Super Bowl champion Chicago Bears. Jim McMahon expected to be back in action. Monday night at 9 Eastern time. Oh, and over the year they played some mean ones in this series. Penalty flag on the last play. Here's Jerry Mark Bright. Illegal block, number 27 on the return. First down. Barney Bussey with the illegal block off Martin's return. Bussey, a rookie out of South Carolina State, and that will push the Bengals back to the 10 yard line. First and 10, Cincinnati. Sideline huddle there. They have called the play up to the line of scrimmage. What they gain from it, I don't know. Marty Schottenheimer says, we don't pay much attention to it. I tell my players, don't be worried about what they're going to do. Don't worry about what we're going to do. And here we have another timeout. They have used two timeouts now here in the first half. So the Bengals, and again, what they're trying to do is somewhat confuse if they can. And Sam White keeps talking about a 2% factor. He said maybe it gives us a 2% edge, but right now it's given them about a 67% disadvantage because they've used two-thirds of their timeouts already. Well, I guess it's like the video replay. There's going to be a lot of bugs in it until you get it working in smooth gear. But in, on that occasion, they were just running out on the 30-second clock. And they had nothing to do but call the timeout. And exactly what they attempt to gain from it is to know who is on that field defensively for Cleveland. College football today. Coverage begins at 3 Eastern time. CFA College Football and our two regional presentations for you this week. The Trojans coming off their win against Illinois, taking on the ninth-ranked Baylor Bears in Waco, or the Clemson Tigers and the Georgia Bulldogs between the hedges in Athens, Georgia. You ever been there, Frank? I would say. Never been there, no. Georgia Stadium, Sanford Stadium in Athens. Turned out a few decent players down there. Sam Weich was an interesting football player. He came up and as a walk-on quarterback out of Furman, got a job with Paul Brown, and when Paul Brown 
became a principal owner and the general manager and vice president of the Bengals when they were formed in 68. Made the football team, played there two or three years, then went off and played with the Colts, played with Washington, picked up a lot of football, and picked up a lot of football from a man named Bill Walsh, where he was a quarterback coach out in San Francisco in 79 and 80. He brought a lot of innovations to this Cincinnati football team, and he has he had them playing well at the end of last season, and they have certainly moved the ball offensively tonight, but they've hurt themselves. First and 10 from the 10, and Kinnebrew gets racked up at the line of scrimmage. And a penalty marker is down at the 12-yard line. Ray Ellis in on the hit. And another penalty against Cincinnati. So the dis and Schottenheimer is saying we'll take the play, which was no gain. Holding number 50, offense, first down. That's Dave Remington, the center. And the option there is if you want to take the penalty at this point, it wouldn't be 10 yards because it would only be half the distance to the goal line. So you're looking at you want it to be first and 15 or second and 10. I think Remington and the Browns opt for second and 10. I think he might lift a few weights. <laughs> like my thighs. A former great All-American at Nebraska. He won the Outland and the Lombardi Award. First round pick in 83 and he is rapidly turning into a great one at center. It's a huge offensive line. This offensive line for the Bengals and they're good. Second and 10 from just outside the 10-yard line. Bengals on top 3-0. A minute 43 to play in the first quarter. Esiason Lofting one and then dropped by Kinnebrew, who had a little bit of room on the side, but started to turn before the pass got there. And Esiason got hit by Eddie Johnson as he released. So much blitzing today. Again, Eddie Johnson coming, number 51, and forcing the quick pass. And now with no huddle on third down, third down and 10, it's thrown away out of bounds. And Cincinnati will have to kick. Another flag is down, and let's see what it is. If it's against Cincinnati, the attack huddle, as I'm sure that one was, where they memorize a play and just have one word that gives them the play, the formation, and the snap count. And that's what that was. And let's see if the penalty isn't because of it, but it, we have a very confusing situation for Cincinnati tonight. Lots of penalties. They've had trouble with the clock getting the plays off there. They have been explosive when they can get the playoff. So the Bengals pretty much in disarray that one decent drive stopped on the interception. They lead three nothing. Here's we Mark have Ray. offsetting fouls. We have illegal substitution. Twelve men on the field defense. That's a good way to we do it. We have illegal formation <laughs> offense. No man on the end of the line. Isn't that something they try to confuse them. So they got they got the Browns to do what they wanted them to do and that is be penalized for having an extra man on the field or hopefully they come up short if you're the offense. In the meantime their formation was illegal. It's like a fire drill out there. Looking like a street game at this point third down and ten. No split huddle no attack huddle they huddled and came up to the line of scrimmage. Normalcy is returned. Esiason hitting Brooks and it is incomplete. He never had possession. Matthews was there, but Brooks should have had it for the first down. He had the yardage, ran the pattern wide open. Matthews back there, trying to cover Brooks with the linebackers. Forget it. So fourth down and ten. And back to receive is Gerald McNeil. Well, you have the refrigerator, Perry. You've got the kitchen, Nathaniel Newton, down in Dallas. And at 5'9", 146, they've nicknamed McNeil the Ice Cube. As he stands at the 50-yard line, Jeff Hayes to kick. And he has a block for the second time this season. And a touchdown, Frank Minifield. Felix Wright with the block. Minifield with the touchdown. The second time already this season that Hayes has had a kick block and the ensuing result touchdown. 
This kills you. The snap pulled Hayes out of the pocket a little bit. The right still came from the far side. Felix Wright, plenty of time to get there. Timed it out beautifully. Minifield in great position to make the recovery. And you just can't have block kicks. Cleveland has been unable to do anything offensively. And now their special teams has given them the go-ahead. And Matt Barr's extra point attempt is good. As we see it again from the reverse angle. And so Hayes, who had it happen on opening day in Kansas City, lives it again. The snap does pull Hayes off just a little bit. And a little slow getting it off. But that wasn't even close. Wright was right there. Minifield covering very easily. In Kansas City in the opener, Mark Robinson blocked a Hayes punt, and then Darren Cherry fell on it in the end zone. That was Hayes' first punt as a Bengal, and this is his last. His last at the moment. <laughs> Don't be forecasting here, Al. Yeah, right. Wanted to clarify that. There's one tough little <laughs> cornerback. He's 5'9", 180 pounds. He loves to play man-for-man -man defense. You can tell when Cleveland's going to be man-for-man -man or zone defense, according to their coach, Marty Schottenheimer. They call it in the huddle, and if they call the zone, he comes out shaking his head. No, no, no. If they call man-for-man, -man, he comes out bobbing his head up and down. He likes that. He likes the bump and run. He likes the contact, as does Hanford Dixon over on the other side. Not big, but they're tough. Yesterday. Had a touch of the flu, but okay today and ready to kick off from the 35 yard line with Cleveland now on top seven to three. And it's a bouncing kick that is taken at the four yard line by Tim McGee. And the rookie speedster out of Tennessee has some room 25 and he gets out to the 30 yard line. And from there, will the Bengals commence this next drive with 105 to go in the first quarter? Kind of fun to come back, number one draft pick, even if you come back with Cincinnati, having gone to high school here in Cleveland, as Tim McGee did, went to John Hay High School. All his, all his former teammates showing up tonight. McGee was drafted in the first round. He was actually the second choice. The Bengals with two Offside, number one choices. Number 86, kicking team, penalty declined, first down. That was Brian Brennan who was offside. They'll take the run back, which brought it out to the 30. Their number one pick overall, the linebacker to whom we referred earlier, Joe Kelly. He was showing a lot of respect for Matt Barr, wasn't it? They could have penalized Cleveland, backed them up a little bit, and five yards, and perhaps run it past the 30, but they decided to go with the return. Matt Barr over the sidelines. Look at me. I'm, I'm all right. Hmm. First and ten, Cincinnati with McGee in motion from the 30-yard line, and it's Brooks trying to get out of the backfield and can't. Brooks is buried in the 28-yard line. The charge led by Chip Banks. I mentioned before with Banks holding out, and just to follow up on it, one of the things he initially sought in the new deal was a guarantee he wouldn't be pulled out in certain situations. He did not get that in the contract. He very definitely did not get that in the contract. And Marty Schottenheimer was very adamant about that today. But he is a great football player. Pro Bowl selection, even though he didn't make it a year ago. Second and 11 from the 29-yard line. Fake pitch, and then Esiason gets pressured, and the low throw is caught at the 38-yard line by the tight end, Rodney Holman. That's his 12th catch of this young season. Let's take a look at the block punt once again, right down at the bottom of your screen. Just driving straight forward. He got a little help on the inside. Robert Jackson took the blocker on the outside, and he split the gap, and Minifield was right there to cover. And that was the big play of the first quarter, which has now expired, so we've played 15 minutes in Cleveland. And we go to the second quarter. On the shores of Lake Erie with the Browns leading the Bengals 7-3. On first quarter, at 5 of 9 Eastern time, we start the second quarter. And the Cincinnati Bengals come out. It will be third down 
and two. They have the ball at their own 38-yard line. The Cleveland Browns on top by a score of seven to three. Each team coming in one and one. Winner goes into first place in the AFC Central at this early stage of the season. Third and two with Brooks in motion. And Esaias is looking toward Brooks and then throwing over the middle and hitting Holman for a first down to the 50-yard line. And Rodney Holman now with 13 catches in a little over nine quarters this year. So they love to go to their tight end. You realize he's caught 13 passes already this year, Frank, and we were in Pittsburgh the other night where we mentioned the Steelers all season in 85 through 12 passes to their tight ends collectively. Well, Ehrenberg is their tight end. That's what they'll tell you. And he comes in there a great deal and replaces the tight end. Many times, Steelers don't have a tight end there and in there on a passing situation. McGee in motion to give it to Kinnebrew. And he is stopped at the line of scrimmage. Sam Clancy, number 91, is right there. He's, He's a going, very key man in this Browns defense. He's going to toughen up an already tough Cleveland Browns defense. Former USFL player, outstanding at Memphis. And Cleveland was able to get him when they made a trade with Seattle for his rights. As there are only two sacks thus far of the season. Second down and 10 from the 49-yard line. They send Eric Caddish in motion and run the play back the other way, and Brooks slides to the 45-yard line. And Clancy is again in on the tackle. It'll be third down, and we'll call it six at the Cleveland 45. And I remind you, our ABC Sports exclusive is being brought to you by Chrysler. Driving to be the best and Plymouth, where the pride is back. Chrysler Plymouth, we're working together to be the best. had initially come up without a huddle and then they make some changes this is designed because they have plenty of time on the 30 second clock trying to confuse the defense again it's been the Bengals have been confused because they've used two timeouts already this is the attack huddle as the play that's memorized the formation and the count third down and six and Esaias and throws and a great catch is made by Collinsworth and a penalty marker is down and his forward progress was enough for the first down as he was pushed back by hand prediction. But a flag is down at the 37 as Mark Wright confers with the field judge. That flag coming very late. Collingsworth was on the turf when the flag came in from way upfield. Pass interference, number 80, offense, third down again. So Ricky. that's Collinsworth. Working against Hanford Dixon, who will play you up there tight. I'm sure Boomer Esiason read the single coverage on Collinsworth. They got into a little push and shove within that five-yard boundary where Dixon can work on a receiver. And they made the call on Collinsworth. What an edge he has at 6-5 over cornerbacks. At, in the case of Dixon, 5-10, 5-11. Minifield at 5-9 on the other side. But they're feisty and they love to play that man for man and they love to play it rough. Third down and 16 for Cincinnati. With McGee and Collinsworth to the left. And Esiason going to the right and down the far side for Brown and he's covered like a blanket. He was looking for a flag also. Menefield was running stride for stride with Brown. Esiason wants it also. And Mark Bright conferring, we saw no flag dropped on the play. Menefield said, not me, I didn't do anything. There was a little push and shove, but I don't know whether it took place within that five-yard area in which Menefield is allowed to hinder the receiver. So yet another conference here, an inordinate amount you guys are getting of to know each other, I would say. And that's part of the reason that uh, we're almost at the one-hour mark. And we have 12-17 still to play in the first half. So Jerry Markbright confers with Paul Widener, the yep. head linesman. It's a puzzlement. There is no flag down. Well, we'll get Jerry Markbright to straighten it out for us. Tough on these referees with that type of offense, those types Pass of huddles. Pass interference, number 31, defense. First down. So that was mm. kind of after the fact, wasn't it? I would say I didn't see a flag. Did you? Did not see a flag. 
That's Frank Menafield they call. There's Menafield running stride for stride as I mentioned a moment ago with Brown. Did he have his hand in there? I don't know. He had his hand on the shoulder there. You could call that. But we have seen since they liberalized the rules and allowed defensive backs a little more leeway in their coverage, we've seen many things much worse than that. Again, we did not see a flag if there was one. Well, you could see Merrill Douglas begin to reach, but he was on the far side and may have dropped it on the boundary, and thus it was not in evidence visually. But the call was made, and it's a first down, and Brooks pays the price as he tries to move over the right side. Chip Banks again in on the tackle. Let's take a look at the reverse angle and again there is the official we spotted a moment ago reaching for that fly he had already called the interference or looked like he was going to call it up the field now whether he got that flag out and somebody picked it up I don't know we never saw it up here and then the conference and then the ruling and the Bengals benefit from it second down and 13 at the 39 yard line Esiason throwing and it's knocked away. Collinsworth was right there. Knocked away by Hanford Dixon and also Anthony Griggs. Esiason trying to thread it in there. He had double coverage over on his receiver. Let's take a look at it again. Dixon with a good play coming around the horn if you will. Collinsworth again the intended receivers. They continue to try to work with him on the outside against the smaller cornerbacks. Third down 13. Let's pause five seconds here to allow our local stations to identify themselves. WDTN TV2, Dayton Springfield. The Bengals third and 13 at the Cleveland 39 yard line. Browns lead 7 3, 11 30 to play in the first half. Brooks with some room, Brooks the first down and skirting down the sideline and gets inside the 10 is run down at the six yard line a great play by Brooks Frank Minifield finally makes the stop and one of the Brown defenders who had the best shot at making the tackle before Brooks had the first down fell down and that was Felix Wright the nickelback they beat the blitz it was a safety blitz Chris Rockins coming in that meant individual coverage good read by Esaias and nobody out there with Brooks and the little speedster down the sidelines where Minifield finally settles things down around the 10 yard line or make it the eight yard line but it was a good read by Esiason. He read the safety blitz. He knew there'd be individual coverage downfield. He didn't have time to go there. He got it out to Brooks. Nobody on him. Cincinnati in great shape. First and goal from the seven-yard line, and Kinnebrew picks up two. And that's what you call a gang tackle. As half the defense converges, and it takes a gang to get Kinnebrew down. 263 pounds he weighed in, I think, yesterday. Big, strong. We saw him for the first time four years ago when they brought him into the lineup. And they used him only down close to the goal line at that time, and he was awesome then. Second down and goal. The Bengals with a lot of options here. Esiason can run. Keep that in mind. He likes to roll out. In fact, he scored the touchdown that sent the game into overtime on a rollout from the two on Sunday. Brown split to the right. Esiason going back. James Brooks who came out of the backfield and he's wrestled out by Griggs inside the two. Griggs one of two former Philadelphia Eagles starters who are starting now defensively for the Browns. And a great move by Griggs to get to the outside from that in line inside linebacker position. Linebackers are all about the same 6'3 6'4 weight 230 240 and they're great athletes they are all over the league now. And they are the great athletes in pro football today, I think. They move so fast. They run with backs. They run with wide receivers. Actually, a third former Philadelphia Eagle is also out there in the field for the Browns, Carl Hairston. Third down, goal. At the two. And they have Kiki Diayala in as a blocking back. And Give it to Kinnebrew, and he gets the touchdown, and the crowd doesn't believe the call, and neither do the Browns. And so the call is made by the head linesman, Paul Widener, who was right there. They brought in Kiki Diayala, the linebacker, 
to serve as the blocking back, and he laid one on hand for Dixon as Kinnebrew goes in. That's the Ayala 93, and see if he crosses the plane. That's pretty nifty running. He got the football across the plane. Of course, the crowd doesn't like it. They're partisan Cleveland Browns, and they're right down in front of them. But for a 260-pound running back, <laughs> this is pretty fancy. Big man bounces off the attempted tackle by Eddie Johnson and got the football across the plane of the goal line. That's all he has to do. Should not have been any controversy whatsoever. Replay proves it was a good call as Breach picks the extra point, and the Bengals will take the lead again. 9.42 to play in the first half. They had Di Ayala at 225 pounds, the linebacker as the blocking back, and then Kinnebrew going in. You know why they have him in there, Al? Sam White had volunteers to go back there, said, who used to be a running back? Di Ayala did. So he got the job. A mini refrigerator in the making, perhaps. 9.42 to play in the first half at Cleveland Stadium. Home opener for the Browns who played their first preseason game against Buffalo here in early August and then every other preseason game on the road and then their first two games of the regular season away from home. Schottenheimer said today we felt like Barnum and Bailey mm. touring the country. They lost to Chicago then came back to beat Houston and right now it's Cincinnati leading by a score of 10 to 7 as the kick comes down to the ice tube McNeil and McNeil gets frozen at the 23. And in on the tackle is D. Ayala, the man who just served as the blocking back. So he can be a linebacker for you, serves on special teams, blocks, and he asked Sam White the other day, when am I going to get to carry the ball? <laughs> you know, he might. You know, you stretched out McNeil a while ago, Al. <clears throat> Pardon me. Gave him a 5'9". He's actually 5'7". That is tiny. Flag down, and the Browns will be backed up. You wonder if they ever get a square shot at him on a kickoff, but he played so well for Houston over a couple of years, and he was a good receiver for them. Blinding speed, Gerald McNeil. Played with Jim Kelly with the Gamblers. First down, Cleveland from the 11-yard line after the penalty on the run back, and it's Biner pulling straight ahead out to the 16. Just to refresh you, last year, Cleveland basically a running team. And in fact, they became only the third team in NFL history to have a pair of 1,000-yard running backs. It was Biner and Mack. And as you can see, Biner off to a slow start this season. And the other pairs, just to, to refresh you, if you've forgotten, in 72, Larry Zonka and Mercury Morris each gained over 1,000 with Miami. And in 76, Franco Harris and Rocky Blyer did the same thing with Pittsburgh. Curtis Dickey is now in the game at tailback behind Biner on second and five, and it's Dickey looking for some room, and Dickey springs it for the first down to the 23-yard line. He is stopped by the big, strong safety, David Fulcher, number 33. So 133 stopping the other. You mentioned Al about their offense of a year ago. This is a totally different offense. Marty Schottenheimer was not happy with what he had to do last year with his young 21-year-old quarterback, Bernie Kozar. He brought in Lindy... Infante, the coach that he had worked with with the Giants under Bill Arnsparger in 75 and 76, and was the architect of Cincinnati's Super Bowl team in 1981. It is a, almost a Cincinnati offense with a lot of passing, and the Browns are being a little slow bringing it about, but they're going right back to the basics on this drive. First and 10 from the 22-yard line, it's Biner taking the swing pass and moving it out to the 28-yard line. He got a nice block that time from number 69, Dan on the bench there is Kevin Mack who did not play in Houston he suffered a shoulder injury against Chicago on opening day and he rushed for 117 yards and two TDs in last year's win over Cincinnati here in one game and in the other game did very well and as you can see gaining uh, close to nine yards per carry in the two against the Bengals I'm sure we won't see him he warmed up before the game by now he's cooled off and they wouldn't want to bring him in there after he's cooled off I'm quite sure of that second and four they give it to Dickey again and Curtis works his way up to the 33 yard line so it'll be one of those rare instances where this man to whom you referred earlier Frank Curtis Dickey at one time highly acclaimed and now a reserve back a chance for him to shine he had four years with Baltimore some of them absolutely sensational he came up I don't think 
He reminded me of Willie Gallimore in the type of stride he had, the way he could cut back. And he has not exhibited that. Well, he didn't do it last year. He didn't have the opportunity, as we mentioned, because of Mack and Biner. They both had great years. On first and ten, the pass is short hopped and a penalty marker is thrown. That's Webster Slaughter out of San Diego State who was their second round draft choice. They did not have a pick in the first round and a marker is down. <laughs> who called the foul? Yeah. Mark Bright wants to know who, who threw the flag. You guys ought to introduce themselves. Mm. Holding number 53 defense automatic first down. Leo Barker the linebacker. Who's the rookie out of New Mexico State a Seventh round, well, not the rookie. He's not the rookie either. He's a youngster out of New Mexico State. Called for a holding, and that, of course, gets the automatic first down. He is playing with a very sore ankle tonight. And the rookie, first round draft pick, Joe Kelly behind him, has a pulled hamstring. Cincinnati hurting on the inside linebacker position. Cleveland first and 10 from the 38 yard line, and Biner goes nowhere. It'll be second and nine. Cincinnati on top. 10-7 with six minutes 38 seconds to play in the first half. The Browns with Lindy Infante taking over. Frank talking about that and trying to design a new offense. One of the things that the Browns had to do is go out in the offseason and find some wide receivers. And they even went up to Canada to bring in Terry Greer, but right now he's in a backup role. They have some speed out there to the outside, which the Cleveland Browns haven't had it in a decade. Reggie Langhorn, Slaughter. And they have Langhorn and Slaughter to the left, but it comes back to Newsom, the tight end, but that play doesn't fool anybody and winds up as a loss back to the 36-yard line. Tim Crumry, number 69, makes the tackle. There he is, a man who led the team in tackles last year. That's unusual. It's good for Crumry in the sense very few nose tackles will lead a team in tackles, but it also tells you something about the rest of your defense. Good one in the middle when he came up as a 10th round draft pick. They thought he'd be a little too small for it. They get him out of there on the pass rush situation. They bring in some speed. Jim Scow, a rookie out of Nebraska, comes in, number 70. They like him a lot. Now they literally have three rookies in that defensive unit. On third and 12, and it looked like some miscommunication the way Kozar moved his body off the snap count. It looked like he wasn't prepared to take it at that point. You know and what Emmanuel he was doing. King gets the snap. Well, he was looking at the 30-second clock, which expired right on the snap. Could well have drawn a flag for it. Starts to move away the 30-second clock had run totally down. There is Emmanuel King. Gossett to kick. Oh. Terrible kick. Salute for the Browns punter as he makes his way off the field. We were talking to Marty Schottenheimer about Gossett today. He said he's been very happy with him since Miami. This was an identical kick to the one we saw down there, and it hurts. Plymouth shows America why the pride is. Cleveland, Ohio, all lit up tonight. They do it because uh, the game is on national television on one hand, and they're also taking some shots photographers going around and uh, taking shots of Cleveland lit up at night for some uh, promotional material to be uh, printed later on a, a town undergoing a renaissance in many ways including uh, their baseball team even though the Indians are, are not in contention anymore it was uh, one of the better seasons they have had in several what? meanwhile the Browns here trying to stop the Bengals who have a first and ten Esiason gets decked by Chip Banks. That's how you lose quarterbacks. Of course, Esiason, the left-hander, has his blind side to Banks' side. Watch him disappear. Banks, 235. No way you can tell that he's there except perhaps a moment before impact, you get the hot breath. <laughs> you know you're going to bite it. Tough kid, Esiason. Hops back up. You'll stay in that huddle in the... He's very elusive back there, not 
Quick, not a great runner, but he slides around a little bit like Ken Stabler used to do. Second and ten, Cincinnati from the Cleveland 44-yard line. Bengals are hit by three. Brooks inside the 40, and Brooks has the first down as he goes out of bounds at the 30-yard line. Max Montoya springing him with a nice block, number 65. James Brooks, he is such a special piece of equipment for an offensive team. Get the see number 65, that's Montoya. Stayed with his man, got the block on the strong safety, Ellis, and that springs Brooks, who reads it beautifully. You don't have to take a man out of a play to make an effective block. And Montoya, longtime veteran starter, gets Brooks down to the 30-yard line. 80 total yards for Brooks tonight when he's handled the ball. First down from the 30. Brooks on the reverse, giving it to Brown. Brown looking for a block from Esiason. Boomer throws one, and then Brown is out of bounds. So Boomer Esiason laid the last block as Matthews gets credit for the tackle. Eddie Brown with that great speed. You like to use the reverse to the speedster. You come back with the play that worked a moment ago. You give it the same look. You sweep right, and then you hand it off on the reverse, hoping you'll be going totally against the grain with the pursuit. And that was effective. They get the first down, and you're right. Esiason was out in front throwing a block. First and 10, Cincinnati from the 18-yard line, 4.43 to go in the half. Bengals on top, 10-7. Picks up close to four. Bengals use will be the fourteen. Bengals use that reverse quite frequently. They like to use a Daddy Brown as a rookie. A year ago, he ran it fourteen times and averaged something about nine yards per carry. But it's a very effective play when you're using Brooks on a sweep, as they do on many occasions, because you slow the pursuit down. They have to think. Well, maybe, maybe Eddie Brown's going to come back. So maybe it just causes the defense to hesitate just a moment. Obviously effective for Cincinnati. Second down call at six at the 14-yard line. Pattis in motion. The penalty flag is down, and he overthrows Pattis, but there's a marker down on the near side at the 19-yard line. And it's a motion call against Cincinnati. So numerous penalties in the first half, which now has 353 to run. And at halftime, our ABC News halftime report. Illegal and your motion, local news. Number 82, offense, penalty decline, third down. That was Holman, the guilty party. We'll also have a live interview. We'll be talking with Walter Payton, who is at home in Chicago, and we'll talk to Payton about the upcoming game with the Green Bay Packers. Well, they mauled him up there a year ago. That series going on as long as pro football has, practically. No matter the records, they always seem to play wild football when they get together. Third and six from the 14-yard line as Esiason throws for Brooks, and he can't one-hand it. James Brooks covered by Chris Rockins, but Brooks had him beaten. And the throw just a little off target as Brooks had to reach for it and couldn't come down. Esaias knew he had him. Brooks had Rockins beaten, as you can see. Lay it up in the corner, and Brooks has it. And Esaias knew it. He shook his head, walked off the field, and they have to settle for the field goal unit. Jim Breach, who has already kicked a 49-yarder, this one to be spotted at the 23-yard line, so a 33-yard attempt with Ken Anderson in his 16th year, the longtime Bengal quarterback, now the holder. And the kick is good. 3.43 to play in the first half at Cleveland. Breach with two field goals. And that's the difference in the game at the moment. A moment ago, the Bengals rushing defense, which has been very weak thus far, look what they have given up. And to the teams, Kansas City and Buffalo, they weren't dynamite in rushing a year ago. And thus far, however, the Cleveland Browns, albeit without Kevin Mack, their 1,000-yard rusher to go with Ernest Biner of a year ago, not in there. There he is with a sore shoulder on the sidelines. Uh, Cleveland is having a tough time against a defensive unit 
that was ranked 22nd a year ago in the NFL, the Bengals. And Cincinnati basically has controlled the football in this first half, and that's made a big difference. As McNeil, with two flags going down, is stopped at the 17-yard line. John Simmons, the cornerback, in on the stop. And the call on the run back is against the Browns. Sloppy game tonight. Penalties seemingly almost on every other play. Illegal block, number 72, on the run back. First down. Dave Pizzuli, former Pitt Panther in his fourth season. Bob Golick's backup at nose tackle. So that backs the Browns up to their own eight-yard line, first and ten. Kozar has Biner and Dickey in. Dickey the tailback from the eight. And Dickey is the ball carrier. Curtis to the 12 with three and a half minutes to play in the first half. Big crowd, about 75,000 in a ballpark that holds close to 80,000, but they've been quieted. Not a sellout, consequently, this game was blacked out in the Cleveland area. They've been quieted basically by the Bengals' defense and the fact that the Bengals have controlled the football and the Bengals lead 13 to 7. Dickey gets a nice block from Biner and turns it out past the 20 to the 27 yard line. Gotta love Biner as Bobby Kemp made the tackle. Biner gained over 1,000 yards last year and watched the block by 44. 44 nearest to you, and Dickey will kind of lay back, taking out Emmanuel King in a beautiful block, and able to turn the corner is Curtis Dickey. Maybe he doesn't have the speed that he had coming up, but that was Bobby Kemp who took him out of bounds. But that's the first major thing they have done on the ground offensively for the Cleveland Browns. I believe the clock is not operating, and that is the reason for Mark Bright. What the clock is doing here, it's going in and out. Right now it shows 256. It briefly went to the zero mark, and right now we assume that is the official time, 256 to play in the first half, and that's not confirmed for us. First down from the 27th. Dickey straight ahead. We had clock problems in Pittsburgh the other night, Frank. I guess what we need is John Cameron Swayze in here. Fairly rare. Of course, this stadium and Pittsburgh still playing their baseball schedule out, and I think that might have something to do with it. There was a baseball game played here last night. Our people coming in here late to get things underway as we look at one of the injury. Cincinnati Bengals and that is Kemerai we've been talking about the nose tackle and mm, that would be a, a very big loss looking at that right knee and there he is leading the Bengals in the first two games and the centerpiece of that defensive line he's flanked by Ross Browner and Eddie Edwards but Tim from Wisconsin Really beginning to come into his own and they work on him and there are some anxious people right now on that Cincinnati sideline. Halftime we're going to be talking uh, with Walter Payton who will be joining us from Chicago to we want to congratulate him. 100th career touchdown there is Walter. Connie probably hovering around there somewhere. And we can also look forward to that game on Monday night. Bears and the Packers up in Green Bay. But that is an encouraging sight right there because when you begin to work on the leg, you don't want to speculate, but the, it's encouraging that he can walk off under his own power. But for the moment, Mike Hammerstein will come in to take his spot in the middle of the defensive line, number 71. I might ask Walter Payton and McMahon will be available. Mm -hmm. I remember a year ago, we were up in Minnesota and they told us that he would only play, McMahon would only play if there was a disaster. He came in in the third quarter and just tore up Minnesota. First two touchdowns out of the first three passes we threw, and we found out what a disaster was to Chicago. It was a nine points down. Turned out to be a disaster for the Vikings. Dickey, back of Biner, who again springs him loose as he takes King out of the play. And Dickey 
picks up the first down. It was Dan Fike with another block, and Viner took care of King again. 44 takes care of 90, and then Fike throws the other block, number 69. Blackboard sweep. It, indeed it is. Watch 69. That's Fike. And, of course, Viner out in front of it. You get the seal to the inside. Brown's hurrying up, trying to get a playoff before the two-minute warning. I don't think they're going to make it. Now they bobble the ball in, trying to hurry it up. And, and I think that Cincinnati's going to come back with it. At the 47-yard line, let's see about the call. Unless they it, indicated I, that the two-minute warning had taken place. That's the place. thing right now. They've got it. They had not whistled it dead. Let's hear what Mark Wright has to say. Two-minute warning before the snap. Okay. Mark Wright's right. Even though the whistle didn't blow, I could look at the clock across the way and see that the two-minute mark was there before the ball was snapped. So the two-minute warning in Cleveland where the Browns are trying to get it moving on this drive. They're down by six. Cincinnati on top by a score of 13 to 7 with two minutes to play in the half. Browns have all of their timeouts remaining. They have Dickey and Viner in the backfield. They have Brennan to the left and Slaughter to the right. And Pozar throws for Viner who takes it at the 49 and is wrapped out of bounds by Leo Barker at that spot. Stopping the clock with 154 and a gain of four yards on the play making it second down and six. Watch it near the bottom of your screen. That's King coming on the blitz. And Kozar reads it beautifully. He goes right to the area where King had departed. And he finds Biner. Biner takes it out of bounds after the pickup and stops the clock with 154. So they can serve a timeout or at least pick up some additional time. They don't have to hurry their offense. Second down and six. From the 48. Biner to the 46-yard line. So it'll be third down and three. The Browns with all of their timeouts, and yet they elect to go without a huddle as the Bengals are a little confused on defense. And now... You're either going to do it or not do it. You rattle off about eight or ten seconds in. I think you're going to have that with... Uh, that was totally Bernie Kozar's decision. He had a play, two plays called in the huddle after he sent Viner off the left side. He had another play called... His own people were slow getting up there. They were confused a little bit by the change of the defensive defensive personnel on the part of Cincinnati. He may have also been doing the uh, the Bengals, and as you can see, they have their sideline huddle defensively as well as offensively. Kozar coming up to the line of scrimmage, and the Bengals moving people in and out. He might have been able to get him with 12 men on the field that he wanted to play. But that's asking a little too much to have that kind of presence in mind. Again, Cincinnati brings their defensive huddle over to the sidelines on the timeout because they quite frankly want to cover up as long as they can the type of personnel they're going to have in the defensive lineup. Will it be will it be a nickel defense? Will it be four down linemen or will it be the three four? They cover it as long as they can. Third down and three. Cleveland at the Cincinnati 47-yard line. A minute 38 to play in the half. Bengals ahead 13-7. Brennan makes the catch. He takes it to the 35. Ray Horton makes the tackle. Brian Brennan out of Boston College where he was on the receiving end of a lot of Doug Flutie's passes. The clock is still running. Two timeouts in the half. First and ten at the 35-yard line. Those are changed the play. I guess he had called in the huddle. Got on an automatic and then had to pass it around. Bernie stepping up. Looks for Langhorn. Pass him at the 25-yard line. And Langhorn is stopped at that spot. Very close to a first down. Bobby Kemp making the tackle. And the Browns take another timeout. What's very interesting here is had they not taken a timeout, the officials may have had to take a timeout to bring the chains in. It's a four-man rush, and it got pressure on Kozar. He had to come out of the pocket, look like he's even thinking run for a moment. Then all of a sudden, he spots the receiver, Langhorn, who was really hammered, really paid that price, and Bobby Kemp unloaded on him. And now the Browns are down to one timeout, and you never know when you're going to need that. I think it might have been wise had they been able to rip off another play and save that other timeout. They might have to use the one they have remaining to get the field goal off. From Rai on the sidelines, he went out a moment ago and has not been told whether he will be back or whether it is doubtful that he will be back. 
That's a loss. You always hate to see an injury, knee injury, but he has played outstanding football for the Bengals. As Kozar goes over it with the guys on the sideline, the ball is at the 25-yard line. We're at second down and inches in a minute and five to play. That was Lindy and Fadi, the new offensive coordinator, who handles all the play calling. They do it by substitution more than wigwagging it in. And he is in working in concert with his other offensive coaches who are high up in the stadium charting plays watching the defenses getting up getting frequencies second down and inches at the 25 yard line with Langhorn in motion Langhorn goes back the other way to make the catch and Langhorn inside the 10 the 5 and out of bounds at the one and a half super effort and again on the blitz they brought Reggie Williams the linebacker and read instantly by Kozar Got it out in the flat. You'll see 57 coming to your picture, bottom of your screen. He's Reggie Williams, the linebacker. There he is. And Langhorn down the sideline. John Simmons misses. Good running. And the man who brought them back against Houston last week gives him a big play down inside the five. And the clock stops with 57 seconds to play in the half first and goal at the one. And they bring Fontenot in there, number 28 along with Viner and that Johnny Davis is in at fullback for the first time tonight and that's Davis leading the way for Viner and Viner gets inside the one yard line and Reggie Williams number 57 is in on the stop. This is where you wish to have that timeout back one of those timeouts as you have got to conserve that one to get your field goal unit on the field. Meanwhile Curtis Dickey now comes in with the play. Davis goes out, clock down to a half minute, second down and goal. Dickey can't get it, and now they're down to having to take that timeout. And they stop the clock with 18 seconds. Simpkins, number 56, Ron Simpkins. The linebacker in on the tackle. Got yourself a problem now with 18 seconds remaining. You have no more timeouts. You're down where you would like to go with the pass, and of course that would stop the clock, the incompletion. I'm sure that's what they'll give Kozar something into the end zone, unless you for sure have your receiver. Then throw it away, stop the clock, and we'll get the field goal unit out. Field goal to it bring them to within three points. Meanwhile, they have another problem right now. Ernest Biner was shaken up on the play, and he's down on his knees at the 18-yard line, or down on one knee anyway. I think he's getting a little R and R during the timeout. He's also windmilling his right arm. And Dan Funny has given the play to Kozar. Probably in this situation in concert with head coach Marty Schottenheimer. So third down and goal. And with no timeouts left. The Browns with one play to try to get six. And if that fails, we'll see Boy. Travis Tucker and Ozzie Newsom, the double tight end setup. As Kozar rolls to his right, Kozar throws into the end zone, and Newsom can't make the catch. Reaching for it, he was covered by Reggie Williams, and Ozzie couldn't come down with the football as Emmanuel King put the pressure on Kozar. Kozar, not one of your nifty rollout type quarterbacks, but he got out there, got to the man who has been the big play man for years, Ozzie Newsom. Newsom couldn't come down with the pressure, as you can see, by Emmanuel King. Kozar throwing off balance. Got it in there where you would expect. Newsom would come down with it. He didn't do so, and the field goal unit is on. A good play by Reggie Williams there to stay with Newsom all across the field. So Barr on a field goal that's actually shorter than an extra point by a yard from the nine. 13-10 Cincinnati. 
with only eight seconds now to play in a very very long first half. Now the first weekend I think the average time of an NFL game was around three hours and 14 or 15 minutes and then we speeded things up last week to something like 306 and uh, not off to a, a good start though average wise for week three because this baby is going to go for a while. And we took Dallas and the Giants into a different time zone. <laughs> good drive by Cleveland. They looked as though they just went back to the basics and they moved the ball on the ground. Of course the big play to Langhorn on a blitz by Cincinnati that was read beautifully by Kozar. He got it to Langhorn. He broke a couple of tackles and got him down inside the five yard line. But again for a defense that was 22nd in the league a year ago as was Cincinnati. They put up quite a showing down there inside their own five. They've been tough defensively tonight. Back to receive is McGee, but chances are he's not going to see the football. Bar figures to bounce it and try to put it into the hands of one of the up people. Then he kicks a line drive, and McGee will get it, but into the corner at the 10 yard line and goes nowhere. Johnny Davis makes the tackle at the 20, and the clock is down to four seconds now, left in the half. Again at halftime, we'll be talking to Walter Payton about the upcoming game Monday night, Green Bay and the Chicago Bears. We watched the Green Bay Packers and the Bears on a Monday night last year. Our first look at the refrigerator, his first carry of the football that used him as a blocker before. I think we said something to the effect a legend is being born. It would be dancing and singing in the streets. We weren't far wrong. Mm. You underestimated him. He's an international hero. He is big in London. Esiason runs out the first half. And so at halftime Cincinnati 13 and Cleveland 10 and our special Thursday edition will return after this word and a message from our local stations. So halftime Cincinnati 13 and Cleveland 10. And the Cincinnati Bengals will be kicking off to the Browns as we begin the third period. Gerald McNeil is back to receive. And right now he is in conference with Herman Fontano and also Reggie Langhorn, the two men flanking him, and Jim Breach, who had a pair of field goals in the first half, ready to kick off for the Bengals. So here we go, the third quarter. Mild night in Cleveland as Langhorn from the four yard line comes out to the 20 and gets wrapped up there. And it's the backup tight end, number 84, Caddis, who makes the tackle. As we look at the numbers through the first 30 minutes, Frank. That long drive at the end of the second quarter got Cleveland at least respectable. And Cincinnati dominant, but the real dominating factor in that first half has been the Cincinnati defense. Mack is not playing their thousand yard rusher of a year ago who combined with Biner for a thousand yards also. He is not in the ball game. Sore shoulder and I'm sure we won't see him tonight. So Bernie Kozar and the Browns from the 21 yard line. Biner the running back. The sole back in this set. No gain. It'll be second and ten. Stopped by the big strong safety David Fulcher number 33. And when you talk about strong safeties. Well there's a free safety for you and a man on the spot Chris Rockets he of course is filling the spot once occupied by Don Rogers you know the Rogers story dying during the summer the cocaine overdose and a man who is greatly missed by many of the Browns that became very apparent to me yesterday at practice second down and 10 from the 21 yard line as the pitch goes to Dickey and a flag is thrown and Dickey gets it up to the 22. Modell, a fine, fine man, the owner of the Cleveland Browns, and a man who feels very deeply about what's happened to Don Rogers and feels very deeply about the drug problem, was sort of in a quandary about memorializing Don Rogers, and he felt it could not be done in a public sense. In other words, not with a black armband or that sort under the circumstances. Holding number 71, defense. Tacked on to the end of the run, automatic first down. But to follow it up, it did not diminish the feelings. And there is Art Modell looking on from his box, the longtime owner and president of the Cleveland Browns, and a very special man. 
and a man who, as I say, cares very deeply about not only the problem in athletics, but in society, period. First down from the 28-yard line as Dickey takes it up to the 29 for a gain of one. The irony of the tragic death of Don Rogers from the Cleveland Browns is that the Cleveland Browns have been so progressive in dealing with drug abuse. Sam Martigliano, the coach who Marty Schottenheimer replaced a couple of years ago, set up what they call the inner circle here with the Cleveland Browns, which still exists, and that is uh, no names mentioned. You come together, you gather together. If you have had a problem, if you feel you might have a problem, very progressive move on the Cleveland Browns, and yet the irony of it, the tragic death of Don Rogers, a great football player, and it was a loss, a tragic loss of a human being. Dickey breaks it out past the 40 to the 41-yard line. And again, if you're joining us late, Kevin Mack, who teams with Biner in the backfield, is injured, did not play last week, and was questionable and has not played, and apparently will not play tonight. So they've been going with Dickey now at the outset of the third quarter. Let's watch Dickey again. He was a 1,000-yard rusher back in 1983. Got the quick moves. Again, I've watched him come up as a rookie out of A&M, Texas A&M, and Ooh, he reminded me of Willie Gallimore with those quick cuts, quick moves. First and ten from the 41. Set up the screen to Biner. And he's into Bengals territory. Takes it to the 39-yard line. So it's Dickey, 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 and then the screen to Biner, and the Browns are on the move with the Cincinnati 39. This is kind of what the Browns were doing in the second quarter. Back to the basics. Run, 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 then come with the sure percentage pass and this is what it is they got the blitz from Emmanuel King over the strong side and it was read quickly by Kozar he got it to Biner nobody there because King was in on the pass rush and the game is inside the 40 yard line of Cincinnati first and 10 Cleveland Dickey the tailback Biner the fullback Langhorn wide right Slaughter wide left and nowhere goes Dickey Leo Barker coming up from his linebacker spot number 53 to make the tackle. Second and 10. 12 15 to play. Third quarter. Cincinnati 13, Cleveland 10. Again, each team coming in 1 and 1. Houston is 1 and 1, and Pittsburgh 0 and 2 in the AFC Central. And around here is where they love to go to Ozzie Newsom. He works so effectively when the coverage starts to close up as you get deep into the opposition's territory. And the Bengals, second along, they like to blitz, and that's what they're doing. On second and ten, touch pass for Biner, but overthrown. And it will be third down and ten. Bernie Kozar, still 22 years old, the youngest quarterback, the youngest starting quarterback in the National Football League. And as Frank mentioned at the outset, Kosar graduating early, very bright guy, would have been a senior at Miami this year. Instead, he's in his second year with the Browns. Third down, call it 11 from the 40. Kosar steps up. Langhorn makes the catch at the 21-yard line. First down, Browns. Lewis Breeden making the stop. Breeden, one of the better ones. He again had to respect Langhorn. There's no such thing that helps more than speed for an outside receiver. You take the drive deep. You force the defensive back to cover you from a deep position, as Breeden had to do, number 34. And then you break it off in a good pass by Kozar. And I wonder if maybe Ozzie Newsom's knee, which troubled him a week ago for the past two weeks, isn't bothering him because he's been out of there on many pass situations. And right now, Travis Tucker is in there as the tight end that's he on the right side. And that's Brennan going in motion. And that's Dickey, the ball carrier. And he spins his way to the 19, gets a couple. It'll be second down and eight. Carl Zander making the tackle. 10.50 to go in the third. Browns down by three and on the move. Just nuts and bolts, and that's what they're doing. They're straight ahead blocking it. They're coming with the high percentage pass. They were frustrated throughout the first quarter, the Cleveland Browns, well into the second quarter, and then all of a sudden they came back on a late possession. They went with the 
run play, off tackle. They went with the sweep. They went with the sure percentage pass, and it's paying off for them as they are starting to move the ball well. This is Biner to the 16-yard line. Upcoming will be a third down and five. Big play on this long drive, the opening drive of the second half. Ernest Biner, a late draft choice three years ago out of East Carolina, discovered almost by accident. They were looking at films of a guard, Terry Long, and wound up seeing Biner in the films, and he went in the 10th round. and Ray Horton were right there to make sure nothing was doing for Ernest Biner and in comes the field goal unit. Good defensive play by both Horton and Barker. They were out there to sandwich Biner and again Ozzie Newsom not in. That's where they like to go to him when they get a critical down third down and short and I have noticed down on the sidelines they are talking to Ozzie. They are rubbing his left shoulder as the field goal unit is on. Bar. It'll be spotted at the 24. This is a 34-yard attempt. And it's good. So the drive bogs down, but it consumes six minutes. And we're tied with nine minutes to go in the third quarter in Cleveland. Part of the game was in the game throughout the first half. He was a the man they went to when they were down close at the end of the first half. He tried to go back in a while ago, and I watched it on the sidelines. That's Howard Mudd, the offensive line coach, standing over Newsom. And they took him back to the bench. Newsom has not missed a football game since he was in junior high school. Not missed a start, that is. Remarkable tight end. 505 career receptions, far and away the most by any tight end. But they miss him. So the game is tied, and Barr kicks off, and it's taken by Tim McGee. And McGee runs it back out to the 26-yard line. For what it's worth, take a look at this. It's early in the season. If a team starts out with a 2-1 and one record, and the winner of this game will be 2-1, and one, since the NFL went to the 16-game schedule, almost half of those teams have gone to the playoffs. But if you start out 1-2, and two, and the loser will have that mark tonight, only one team in five has gone to the playoffs. Steve Hurt has struck again. Oh, yeah. On first down... Fake reverse, and Brooks takes it out to the 31-yard line. For a gain of four, it'll be second down and six. And a variation of the reverse that the Cincinnati Bengals ran earlier in the game. They like to bring number 81, their speedster Eddie Brown, around. We mentioned they ran it some 14 times a year ago, and there's Bernie Kozar, still in the learning process, age 22, far and away the youngest starting NFL quarterback. Second down, five. Game tied, 13-13, and that much time remaining in the third period. Esiason with a very deep drop, and then throwing over the middle, complete, and paying the price at the 35-yard line is Collinsworth, Chip Banks, who loves to hit you. Collinsworth came all the way from the left side, and... Missed the first down by about a yard. Banks was just watching him all the way. Nailed him short of the first down. Third and a yard. Collingsworth has not been as effective as one might have thought he would have been working against the shorter defensive cornerbacks. Andrew Dixon at 5, 10 or 11, and then at field at 5, 9. Now they've got D. Ayala in there in the backfield along with Kennebrew, and Kennebrew and goes all the way into Cleveland territory to the 47. Now remember, Kennebrew at 260-something, give or take a couple of pounds. We can't give you the precise figure when you're up in that area. And then you've got D. Ayala, the linebacker slash blocking back, 93 at about two and a quarter leading the way. And look at Kennebrew, the littlest man out there. Minifield had to make the stop. And it was Minifield against the 263-pound Larry Kennebrew. Great name for the smallest guy on the field, isn't it? Minifield. Perfect. First down from the 47. And there's Kennebrew again 
Whoa. one of the smallest men on the field and getting to the 32-yard line. Gaping holes over the right side. It, of course, a different play. No lead block on it. Take a look at it again as the big man can start quickly. Excellent. Acceleration over the right side. Plato's Montoya. Just man, man blocking, and they did a tremendous job. And he does the rest when he pops into the open. That's 10 carries for him and 51 yards, and he's already scored a touchdown. And the Bengals have it at the Browns' 33-yard line. Brooks. And he takes it to the 30. And then Minifield gets involved here as well. Frantic blowing of those whistles because that's where you can really be hurt. As a running back where you have your legs tied up in somebody's arm, somebody's got you around the chest, particularly if you're about 180 pounder, which Brooks is, and he came out of that looking for Minifield, who was the last Cleveland Brown defensive player in on that tackle. You don't blame him because that is the one spot where you can get hurt. Many spots where you can get hurt, but that for a running back is the most dangerous. When somebody has you around the legs, you have the cleats planted in the turf, and they start to twist. Things start to break and give. Second down, six. Cincinnati at the Cleveland 30-yard line. The bull, Kinnebrew. Amazingly nifty, isn't he? He stopped. Minifield isn't shying away, though. He's in on the tackle again. And he's given away, uh, I would estimate, about 80 pounds. Minifield at 180. And again, we figure around 260 for Kinnebrew tonight. High 250s. Minifield likes that. He's feisty. He's tough. He loves the bump and run. I mentioned earlier in the game. He hates to go into his own. He likes to play man for man. He likes to challenge the receiver. And we have seen the past couple of downs. He likes to be in on the tackle. He'll hurl that little body in there. Total disregard for its care. Third down and three. Kennebrew again. Minifield. First down. And it's number 31. In on the in on the play again. Amazing. Again, you're giving away 80 pounds here. Long day for Menafield. They've been coming at him with Collinsworth. They did earlier in the game. They've kind of gotten away from that as Menafield goes to work. Hard to bring down a big man like that when you sort of like chicken wrestling. First and ten. Cincinnati from the 21. That's McGee, the rookie, wide out in motion. Kinnebrew again, punishing the defense for two or three more. Stopped by Anthony Griggs, number 53. Minifield took the playoff. I don't blame him. <laughs> Still amazingly nifty on his feet. Kinnebrew with all that size, only 6'1", so it's rather compact. He took about a 6'6", six 240-pounder six, and hammered him on the head. He is strong. We watched him in his debut, I guess very close to that, here in Cleveland four years ago. They used him down on the goal line. He did that on that occasion, too. Just ran over tacklers. On second and seven, it's Brooks cutting back and gets wrapped down by Clay Matthews. Swinging arm tackle by number 57, the nine-year linebacker out of USC. And, and the pro ball at the 15-yard line. Pro bowler a year ago. Matthews has been there on a couple of occasions. He filled in for Chip Banks, who couldn't go because of a virus infection, but you don't hear that much about Matthews, but he's one of the best in the business. You don't hear it because the celebration of Chip Banks here in Cleveland, and prior to that, Cousineau is now, I understand, the San Francisco 49er. Third down and five. Big play from the 16-yard line, and the pass is caught at the 10, and out of bounds is Mike the first down at the five-yard line. Martin in motion, the fourth-year wide receiver at Illinois, and Collinsworth and Brown naturally get much of the acclaim. But they did Martin a screen. They screened off both the defensive backs. They brought Martin in behind it. There could have been flags flying all over the place because Collinsworth screened the safety, and you got McGee screening the cornerback, and Boomer Siason fired a ride right out to Martin. Now the Bengals with 2.28 to go in the period. Been an interesting quarter in that the Browns consumed six minutes on their long drive, and the Bengals have had the ball the rest of the time, and it's Kinnebrew. He was still on his feet and fighting <laughs> forward to the one-yard line, or the one-and-a-half, and, and 
Anthony Griggs will get credit for the tackle. Looking for an MVP of this drive. Big Larry <laughs> Kennebrew. Griggs is that inside linebacker we spoke of earlier who was a starter for the Eagles pre Buddy Ryan days as is another defensive starter for Cleveland Ray Ellis a strong safety who actually is filling in for an injured Al Gross but Ellis has only been here about 10 days so he is just kind of working himself in second down goal from the one and a half it's Kinnebrew again and wow. in there and I suppose rightfully so he did all of the work on that drive Kinnebrew goes in for the touchdown and Cincinnati has the lead he went right over Griggs with 147 to go in the third. Ought to be some kind of an appliance we can name him. <laughs> I'm just amazed at how nifty he is. I've watched him play before. But this is far and away the best running that I've seen him perform. He was this grind. Carries a lot of weight, and they like to get him in and out of the lineup because he does fatigue. And according to Sam White, there is a tendency sometimes to lose the football. When he does get fatigued, and he was brilliant on that drive. Ken Anderson holds, Jim Breach kicks, and the extra point is good. 147 to go in a rapidly paced third quarter, and the Bengals are back on top by seven. Long drive, consuming 7-13, 12 plays, and Kennebrew carried seven times on that drive and accounted for 47 of those 73 yards and he has scored both Bengal TDs tonight as breach kicks off Cincinnati ahead by seven McNeil coming back with a kick and he takes it out to the 23 yard line and it will be first down so here come the Browns offensively there's Ricky Bolden the tackle do you know that in a preseason game this year five times he was called for holding and his fiance called him after the game and said, that's more than you hold me in one evening. Well, do it until you get it right. <laughs> First and 10 from the 24 yard line. The holding, not the fiance. <laughs> Fake to Dickey. Kozar throws to Biner. Biner to the 36 yard line and out of bounds. Hey, you think that Cincinnati, this is the one thing they've been giving up defensively, and they've done it on the other side also. They bring that weak side linebacker, and Kozar reads it immediately, and they hit Biner coming out of the backfield, and they have been picking up one big gainer after another just by coming back with the same play. What happens is Emmanuel King, the weak side linebacker, comes, and as soon as Kozar reads it, fires it out there, and Biner's been all alone. Well, it feels like he can go, he can go. Kozar first and ten the 35 yard line with Biner behind them and Biner with the ball and Biner minus Mack tonight picking up four to the 39 yard line with a minute and 25 seconds to play in the third quarter. Uh, as he knew some the great tight end of the Cleveland Browns I think is probably finished for the night. He was troubled with the knee a week ago. They didn't think he'd play. He insisted that he play. He tried to go back in the lineup earlier in the third quarter. I watched it and they just would not let him go back in and they were working on his left shoulder, not the knee. There he is. Newsom pulled a calf muscle and missed the second half of the Bears game. That was opening day, a week and a half ago. Dickey going nowhere and had no help, and the charge was led by Emmanuel King. And on a sweep, the Bengals wind up with four men around the ball carrier. King has been penetrating and coming in. From that weak side, that time with the run call, he was right into the backfield before any of the pulling offensive linemen could get into his face. Third and ten Cleveland. Waning moments, third quarter. Cincinnati 20, Cleveland 13. Goes hard to throw on third and ten. Looking for the first down and incomplete. It was Langhorn and also Brennan both going over the middle and Kozar throwing it between them. That was just pressure. Good pressure by Ross Browner. That's about the first time we've given him a call tonight against Kozar. But he was in there in the face of Kozar. He had to release it actually before his offensive receiver had made his final move. 
And Kozar coming back with Lindy Infante, and you can read the frustration on Infante's face. They lose an awful lot with Ozzie Newsom. I can tell you that for sure. Gossett to kick. Mike Martin back to receive, and that's a good kick. And a sarcastic cheer after Gossett's last effort. And a fair catch back at the 19-yard line. 45-yard boot, and first and 10 for Cincinnati now from the 19. Funny game in the sense the first half sputtered. We had a lot of penalties, and it took forever. And then the third quarter has been played in no time. That's his name, Norman Julius Esiason from Long Island. His mother died when he was very young, very close to his father and his sisters, and he went to the University of Maryland. He was not picked in the first round. He was the first quarterback picked, however, in the 84 draft. He went in round two, and he's turned out to be a gem for Cincinnati. Brooks chugging along, but racked back. Chris Rockins, and that's an appropriate name on that play. And that's also the end of the third quarter. So Cincinnati leads by a touchdown and will return with our Thursday edition after this message from your local station. Recent years have gotten off to terrible starts and finished strong, and they're hoping to reverse it now and go two and one. Key early season game in the AFC Central. And here we go. We start the fourth with a second down and seven for Cincinnati from the 21-yard line. And Asias is throwing and hitting Brown, and it's a first down as he beats Minifield on the play. Eddie Brown out of Miami, where he caught Kozar's passes in college. Meanwhile, if you missed it earlier, let's take a look back at the big trade today, if you have not heard. Jim Everett was drafted by Houston, didn't sign, and then the Oilers sent his rights to the Rams, and Ken Hill, the great guard, the end William Fuller, and draft choices in 87 and 88, the number one picks, and the number five choice in 87 involved in that deal. Houston picking up all that as the Rams take a chance on a rookie. Kinnebrew out to the 37, and we can also tell you we're getting the report tonight that Mark Wilson has a slightly separated left shoulder, and the Raider quarterback will have to sit out Sunday's confrontation with the Giants, and Jim Plunkett will be back in the lineup for L.A. Talk about a cat with nine lives. Jim Plunkett has been bouncing back. He's going to be player of the year. He's going to retire the trophy if he gets it going again. And talk about everything they gave up for Everett when they look down and see Kozar. The Browns, in a supplementary draft, gave up two number ones, a third, and a sixth to Buffalo to get the rights to draft him. So you have to have a quarterback in this game. And Everett, by everyone's standards, figures to be down the line a great one. Kennebrew didn't go anywhere. It'll be third down and two. Cincinnati on top, 20 to 13. Big crowd tonight, over 78,000. Again, the game not sold out 72 hours before the kickoff, so the game is blacked out here in Cleveland. tonight. He gets a block at the line of scrimmage, and he's getting stalemates from Bados and Montoya. And the Ayala is in there now, and once you stand up those defensive linemen, and you put 260 pounds onto a fairly speedy and nifty frame, you're going to get some action. He's really been moving. The Bengals doing a great job converting on third down plays tonight. That's 8 out of 12 third down conversions. So they've been keeping the drives going, and Brooks on first down, spins, breaks a tackle, and gets eight, does James, and crosses into Cleveland territory, where he is stopped by Chris Rockins. Love to watch him run. Every play is full out, 110%. 182-pounder, hurdles the body in there, and you better make sure you've got him. He'll spin away from more tackles. He won great few years with San Diego before coming here. 
He's a potential 2,000 yard man from scrimmage every season. Second down and two. That's Brown in motion from the 47 yard line. And Asias in turns and gives the ball off to Bill Johnson. And Johnson breaks tackles. This is his first carry of the night. He gets inside the 20 and takes it down to the 12. And so they kept using Kinnebrew. And then he was getting a little worn out. And it looked like he needed a blow. And they go with Johnson, who's a big back at 6'2 and 230. The second year man out of Arkansas State on a misdirection first carry of the night breaking a tackle there and springing it he's strong former usfler who had a 1200 yard season in the usfl and they get kinnebrew a break and you come back with a 230 pounder and he not only is nifty he showed some real fine speed so at the 13 yard line it's first down and 10. Johnson coming into the game had carried five times for 25 yards in the Bengals' first two outings. With McGee in motion, it's Kinnebrew again. Cincinnati, Alice, they have rushed for over 210 yards thus far in the night. That has got to be awfully damaging, not only the Cleveland defense, but your the ego of Dave Adolph, the defensive coordinator. Cleveland noted for their defense a year ago. They were a strong defensive team, ninth in the league, and Cincinnati's been running all over them. Well, we're watching the, the running games dominate in the second half, and the Chicago Bears and the great Walter Payton against the Green Bay Packers in Green Bay on Monday at 9 Eastern time. Second down, seven, Brown in motion. Messiah in the play fake, throws to Brown, juggling catch, and then out of bounds at the seven with Frank Minifield covering on the play. Clay Matthews put the pressure on Esiason. And the crowd very quiet right now as the Bengals try to go all the way again. The second time they've had the ball in this half. You mentioned uh, Esiason did not go in the first round. He went in the second round. We have a couple of other starters. We're going to be looking at one starting for Green Bay. Randy Wright who also went in that same draft back in 84 and then Jay Schroeder in Washington is also starting from that draft. Crowd booing as the defensive substitutions are made. Banks, among others, comes out. The crowd knowing that the Bengals have been capitalizing on third down. And there's Johnson or Kinnebrew again, and he gets inside the five to the four-yard line. He is short of the first down as Chris Rockins makes the stop. So now you've got fourth and short, and you lead by seven, and you're playing on the road with 10.56, and I kick the field goal here if I'm White particularly the way their defense has been playing all night. Cleveland has had a difficult time with the exception of one big drive here in the second half and one at the end of the second quarter. They have been totally stymied. He's going to look at the measurement and see just how far he has to go. They do a lot of things well when your defense is playing well. So they're uh, pretty close to a yard short. Reach tonight has made one from 49. He's made one from 33. And the offense responds. You, as you watched White, when White made that signal, there's Breach, and even he applauds this move at the three. Of course, the worst thing that happens to you is that the Browns take over deep in their own territory. But again, it's a gamble of sorts because you're leading by seven. You're running the ball the way they've been running it with Kennebrew. You do go, you go for it. And your defense has played well. It gives you options when your defense plays well. And Kinnebrew has just been busting that offensive and defensive line himself. And he's back there with D.I.L.A. So it's fourth down and goal. And they give it to Kinnebrew, and he has it, and the touchdown. And White, knowing he had the man, keeps on giving it to him, and that's three touchdowns tonight and four this season and at the moment Kinnebrew is on top you know what else that NFL. does this really tells that offensive team that their head coach Sam White believes in them they come out of that huddle and there is fire in their eyes they had a fourth down and a yard to go a lot of coaches would have gone to that field goal Sam White says I've got a hot back in big Larry Kinnebrew we're moving the defensive line out of there we're going to go for it and what it does is is going to make that offensive line so proud of themselves 
We're going to read about Kennebrew tomorrow. We're going to read about Esiason, all the stars, but that offensive line has been, been blowing the defense out of there for Cleveland. And Kennebrew is going to be pretty proud of Anthony Munoz, number 78, who made the block that created a gaping hole. And when you have that much room, that deep, that's a gaping hole. Breach with Anderson holding. Kennebrew was looking for somebody to hit. Nobody there. Great effort by that offensive line. So the Bengals have had the ball twice in the second half and have marched down the field. And there's the man of the moment in Cleveland with Cincinnati on top, 27 to 13. Hey, my man, what's that? Cincinnati Bengals, an exciting and an opportunistic team, have gone back to the basics in the second half here. They've let Larry do it. Kennebrew capping that 81-yard drive to put him up by two touchdowns as McNeil goes back to receive for Cleveland. And the Browns in deep trouble right now trying to get something started against a Cincinnati defense that has played very well tonight. McNeil back into a corner at the nine. Flag down. Run back to the 27. 10-22 to play in the fourth. That offensive line for Cincinnati has been awesome. We talked earlier, this is a tremendous offensive team. You wonder why they do some of the things they do with their huddles. Here is a call of Jerry Markwright. Illegal block, number 50, on the run back. First down, timeout. You wonder why they do some of the things they do offensively. They are so strong. Eddie Brown, wide receiver, Collinsworth, and now Kennebrew to team with Brooks. They're a super offensive team. 27 to 13 Cincinnati as the Browns take over at their own 14 yard line and in rushing yardage right now the Bengals 200 and Cleveland 80 and Cleveland's not going to pick up many more than 80 because they're going to have to go up top down by two touchdowns first and 10 14 yard line play fake by Kozar and the pass is complete to Herman Fontenot and he wrestles his way forward from an 11-yard gain to the 25, and he is stopped by Ray Horton. Montano came out of Louisiana State as a, as a wide receiver, but he was a running back in high school when he was recruited by Bill Arnsparger, and he was recommended to Marty Schottenheimer by Bill Arnsparger and Kurt Schottenheimer, who was an assistant coach down there. First and 10, Browns from the 25-yard line. Kozar, cross-screen pass to Brennan, and that's a first down at the 42-yard line. Lewis Billups making the stop. That's a tough pass that Kozar just exhibited right there. Rolling left, right-handed passer, spotted the receiver. We know Kozar is not going to run very far with it. That's not his game. Here's Brennan. He moves inside. Kozar running away to his left, fires back against the grain. It's tough to do unless you have a powerful arm, and he has that. First and 10, Cleveland at its own 43. 9-10 to play in the fourth. Over the middle. To the 50 is Fontenot, and he takes the ball to the 40-yard line for another first down. Three consecutive for the Browns, who have it together on this drive at the outset. Fontenot, former running back in high school, wide receiver at LSU. You can, Cleveland at the Cincinnati you can use him in... Many ways you can use him as a running back, you can use him as a wide receiver, or you can come back and use him as a wing as he was there. And Fontenot sets up on a wing again, bottom of your screen. Brennan in the slot. And Webster Slaughter outside. First and ten from the 41-yard line. Kozar going to the tight end over the middle at the 29. Travis Tucker and again with Newsom out of the game they've got to go to the bench they're also missing the backup tight end Harry Holt so they go to Tucker who's number three not only number three on your death chart but number 11 in the draft in 85 out of Southern Connecticut State first catch of the night and it came against a full blitz he had single coverage Cincinnati doing a lot more blitzing than they ordinarily do they're doing that quite frankly because of Kozar his youth they're going to continue to do it as long as it's effective. Four plays and four first downs as the Browns have it at the Cincinnati 27-yard line. 
numbers are, the safety valve to Biner, and Biner takes it to the 20-yard line. So his primary receiver and secondary is well covered. He drops it off, and Emmanuel King makes the tackle. And that's not bad when you go to your number three choice, and he winds up picking up eight for you. And the Browns have something going now. They need to get this one in midway through the fourth quarter. And trailing 27-13, they can get this in. It's going to give the entire team a lift. And they've moved it well. Second and three, 20-yard line, 7.05 for play in the fourth. Kozar throwing, Biner has it, and he fumbles the ball out of bounds and should have the first down. It's a catch. David Fulcher made the play, and it's uh, close enough, as you can see, to the first down. Reminder, our telecast is presented by authority of the National Football League. It's intended for the private use of our audience. Any rebroadcast or other use of this telecast without the expressed written consent of the National Football League is prohibited. First and ten. Cleveland Browns at the Cincinnati 16. The Browns with five first downs on this drive. 6.55 to go in the fourth. Langhorn comes in motion to the same side as Slaughter. Those are looking that way, hits Slaughter, and he's wrestled back by Reggie Williams, the 11-year linebacker from Dartmouth. First reception for Slaughter, wide receiver, the teams with Reggie Langhorn, the Browns using youngsters out of the flanks, trying to get the speed that the offense that Lindy and Fanny would like to run, which is very similar to that of Cincinnati. He put it in or worked with it in 79 and 80 and 81, and now he's doing it for the Browns. Second, second and six at the 13-yard line. Fontenot is wide to the left. Goes down the Whoa. sideline. Kozar loses the football. Recovered at the 31-yard line. Ross Browner with the recovery, but the man who made the play was Emmanuel King, number 90. He He's got in there, dislodged the football. Browner gets it back, and the Bengals lead by two touchdowns and half the football. He's been getting burned on occasion tonight. Top of your screen, you see him. Usually Kozar is... Had a play that goes back to we, the area where he vacated. That time, Kozar didn't even see King. Coughs up the football, and Ross Browner is all over it. Ninth-ranked Baylor, or Clemson meets the Georgia Bulldogs. Coverage begins with college football today, Saturday. He might be a young millionaire, but you can see why they earn it. Bernie Kozar a moment ago. Looking to his left, he never sees Emmanuel King, who weighs 250 pounds, puts the helmet right in the sternum, drives him to the turf, ball comes loose, Ross Browner covers, Cincinnati has the football 34-yard line, and Emmanuel King has been burned a couple of times tonight, but this is a much-improved linebacker from a year ago when he was a first-round pick out of Alabama. Esiason giving the ball to Kennebrew. And a loss of two. Now this defense is very impressive for Cincinnati. They have a bunch of kids in there. They started two rookies tonight. They've played another one extensively, Scow. And they have another one, Joe Kelly, a rookie linebacker from Washington that they want to get in there. They've done quite a number on Cleveland Browns. The Browns only lost to Chicago 41-31. They were in that one all the way. Upset Houston 23-20 last week. Cincinnati has dominated them tonight defensively. Second down and 13 for Cincinnati at the 31-yard line. Clock running down, 5-20. Fake reverse. Brooks on a sweep. Brooks turning it down the sideline. And James Brooks cuts it back and is finally tackled at the 16-yard line. Frank Minifield caught up with him. I love him. He gives at 100% effort every time he gets the football. Minifield's been all over that field. He's slow getting up. But Brooks is something special. What a different dimension he brings to an offense. You can do so much with him. If you want to do, he could run back kickoffs, run back punts. This time he just shows the speed to get to the outside, down the sidelines. Rockins forced him back, missed the tackle, and Minifield made the stop, but not until Brooks had done his thing down to the 15-yard line. And that's a 52-yard pickup. 
and it has to be gargantuan rushing yardage now for Cincinnati as they've stayed on the ground here in the second half. They have a first down. They put McGee in motion from the 15-yard line. They keep working on the clock, and it's Kennebrew taking it to the 10. The little man of the big man. Minifield came all the way from his left cornerback position, got all tied up there with Collinsworth. This is the Brooks run here. Now, Brooks is cutting back on Rockins. <laughs> Minifield makes the stop. They bang up the middle with Kennebrew and then earlier with Bill Johnson, who they brought in to give Kennebrew a little bit of a rest, and then they send Brooks to the outside. Uh, they hurt you. About the only mystery left in this one is whether Kennebrew will score a fourth touchdown. On second down and four, he's seeking the first down. Look at him charging and struggling. Never did get him down. Reminder tomorrow on Good Morning America, David Hartman talks with President Corazon Aquino. His talk's continuing about the future of the Philippines and its importance to our country. So watch David's report from the Philippines tomorrow on Good Morning America. David's got a new hairdo. Short hair. I didn't catch him got this a, morning. Got a comb, got it in place. You Must be infectious in our company. You guys got the same barber, huh? We use the same moose. <laughs> Third in the yard from the six. Kennebrew again, and no. They finally stop him for a loss. Hanford Dixon is in on the tackle, and now White will cement it by sending in Breach. So Jim Breach, who's been perfect tonight, and he's been perfect this season. He's four of four in 1986, including the game winner in overtime last week against the Buffalo Bills and tonight as you see from 49 and from 33 and this one will come from the 16 so a 26 yard attempt and the kick is good and that stops the clock with 202 remaining in the fourth and it's 30 to 13 Cincinnati and so what this means is that the Bengals who wanted to get off to a good start this season went into Kansas City on opening day and lost came back home last week and were down by 10 late in the game and were able to tie it on a long field goal by breach and a big pass to Collinsworth from that man Esiason and then Esiason went in for the TD to tie it at 33 and breach won it and they've come into Cleveland and the Bengals so used to getting off the horrendous starts appear to be on their way to going two and one college football USC against Baylor many of you will see that others will see Clemson taking on Georgia CFA college football this Saturday our scoreboard show and coverage will begin at 3 Eastern time we're going to be watching Cincinnati and Cleveland once more this year on Monday Night Football we'll see Cincinnati against Steelers October the 13th and then we'll be coming back to Cleveland November the 10th to watch the Cleveland Browns go against Miami. Do you need a sweater here on November 10th? You could need much more than a sweater at this stadium. <laughs> Played a lot of years here and the weather is weird. McNeil. There's a flag. And he's run out of bounds at the 32 yard line. And Jerry Mark Wright will tell us about it. Hey, one thing about this field now as we wait for the call I hated to come in here and win the toss because we'd receive and they would start us to our right and that means you got to go uphill mm. I hated to go uphill and most football players do particularly running backs and receivers but this one has a definite hill and then wind can Billy be coming in off the lake too number 59 on the return first down timeout two minute warning so that's half of the commercial lead coming to you from Jerry Markbright with a score 30 to 13. Cincinnati such an explosive team with the great wide receivers and yet tonight it's been a basic running attack. Brooks a big night and Kinnebrew a real big night even though Brooks has more yardage much of that came on that last run. Kinnebrew has really been the workhorse. 
Kozar scrambling and fumbles the ball out of bounds. He's not a ballerina, is he? No. 393 yards Cincinnati has put up against a ninth-rated defense in the NFL mm. of a year ago. Granted, it's a defense that has had the parts coming together rather slowly. They lost Al Gross to strong safety, and they had to bring in Ray Ellis after 10 days' work. They had to move Anthony Griggs back inside a linebacker when Chip Banks came in late. Those are things that you have to choreograph a little longer than they've had the opportunity to defensively, but Cincinnati has a great offensive team, and they have been totally dominant tonight. Second and 16. Kozar from his own five-yard line. Liner out of bounds. This is going to be a very nice present tonight for Paul Brown. This is the 500th game in which Brown has been involved as a coach or executive and is the current general manager of the Cincinnati Bengals and the longtime coach of the Cleveland Browns and the man who's been with the Bengals since the inception 500 games in which Brown's been associated and uh, this one will be very sweet for him. Team was named after Paul Brown. Dominated the All-American Football Conference. Came into the National Football League. Beat the Philadelphia Eagles in the first championship game he played in. Innovator in every way. On third and seven they keep the drive alive. Travis Tucker takes it down to the 30-yard line. Played for him in a pro ball a couple of times. Not too communicative, Paul Brown. He just knew what he wanted from his football players, demanded it, either got it or he got a new football player. Very effective. Kozar dumps it off for Finer. And Ernest looking for the sideline to stop the clock and getting into a little shoving match along the way and out of bounds at the 39 with the rookie Lewis Phillips. Later tonight on Nightline from the University of Maryland, Ted Koppel on the impact of drugs on college campuses and the controversy over drug testing of student athletes. Tonight on Nightline following your late local news. And again, we'll be in Green Bay on Monday. Green Bay and Chicago. Kozar, you know, that looks pretty good. You, you'll see that in the newspaper tomorrow, and you'll figure, hmm, if you didn't see the game, good night for Kozar. Check the score, 30-13. Very, very deceiving numbers. He did, though, have a couple of good drives, but he couldn't get the job done when necessary. Incomplete uh, here. We must go back to the fact that Ozzie Newsom has not only come into tonight's game with a very sore knee, but... I do suspect that something might be wrong with his left shoulder. They were looking at that. He tried to go back into the game in the third quarter. They wouldn't let him. When you take Newsom, the all-time leading tight end in football, out of your lineup. But more than that, you take him away from a young quarterback, then you've got troubles because Newsom is a kind of a tight end that'll walk into the huddle and say, I can do this, I can do that. He'll tell him on the sidelines. And you have confidence in somebody who's done it over and over, Pro Bowl many times. They really have missed him. Third and two. And Brendan makes the catch as he gets it out to the 46-yard line. And that's a first down. And the Browns will take a timeout. 49 seconds to go in the fourth. And Cincinnati out in front by 17. Browns come up to their own 46-yard line on first and 10. For what it's worth, Cleveland has two timeouts remaining. Down 30 to 13. Kozar has it batted and it's incomplete. And we can tell you that uh, tonight's game was produced by Ken Wolf and our director, Chester Forty, our technical director, Joe Chavo. Our associate director, Newbar Stone, tech manager, Bill Freeberger, unit manager, Ed McKenna, telecommunications manager, Stu Strelzer, Chaz Wiseman, Bruce Clark, the assistants to the producer, information and stats from Steve Hurt. Our statistician up here is George Hill, and our spotter still from Malibu is Kelly Hayes. Second and ten. And Brennan makes the catch and goes out of bounds. So the Bengals, uh, Frank, uh, as you go back over the past three years, they were 0 and 3 last year. They were 0 and 5 in 84 and 0 and 3 in 83 starting out. They go back a long way playing miserable first halves of the season. 
You go back to the 81 year. Of course they went to the Super Bowl but it's almost been a trademark of the Bengals team and it looks as though they're going to turn that around this year. Brennan just caught that football. He's a sure handed one but the Browns have tried to get wide receivers with speed. Consequently they've gone with Webster Slaughter who has one reception on the night. Reggie Langhorn. I think he might have one. And they've had to go with Travis Tucker who you saw there at tied in because of injuries to Newsom and Harry Holt. Just to fill you in on some other late sports news, Goose Gossage has been reinstated by the San Diego Padres. Gossage had publicly ripped Ballard Smith and Joan Clock, to say the least, and was suspended. And he winds up paying a $25,000 fine, which will go to charity and makes a public apology to Smith and Mrs. Crock. Meanwhile, there are your standings right now as soon as the gun sounds. Price of geese has gone up. <laughs> Second and ten, 44 yard line. Kozar <laughs> in and out of the hands of Travis Tucker. So for the Cleveland Browns, a one and two start, a loss to Chicago, then the victory against Houston, and now the loss tonight, and Lindy Infante and Marty Schottenheimer have one sort of decent thing going for them. When you look at the Browns' upcoming schedule, they have in order Detroit. Pittsburgh, Kansas City, Green Bay, Minnesota, and Indianapolis the next six weeks. If Kansas City beat the team that's beating them tonight. Third and ten from the 44. Lots of curves in the Cleveland Browns road ahead. Webster Slaughter, who has been pretty silent tonight, stopped by Lewis Billups. One rookie tackles the other. First down. Meanwhile, the, as Kozar takes a timeout, when the Bengals resume action a week from Sunday, they'll face the Chicago Bears in Cincinnati. We'll be back. 19 seconds to play. This one's over. 30 to 13. The Cincinnati Bengals with a second half running attack keyed by Larry Kennebrew on their way to a victory. Kosar. Ooh, and taking a shot is Langhorn. Boy, he gets ripped by Ray Horton, the quarterback. 13 seconds remaining. That's smart. Take a look at that again. Kosar is right up there around 300 yards. 277 or whatever it is, but what a shot Langhorn got from Horton. Wide receivers earn it every time they come across the middle. Second and ten. Takes it uh, just inside second base to the eight yard line. And the Browns take a timeout here. They figure they're close enough to try to get it into the end zone, and they might as well end this one on a uh, on a Pyrrhic up note. He said so many times that 300 yard games sometimes are very misleading. Kozar is rapidly approaching that. And yet they. I've been out of this one for much of the fourth quarter. I'll see you in Green Bay Monday night. Bears and the Packers. Looking forward to that one. Get to see all the good old boys. The international star, William Perry, the refrigerator. They love him in London. He's all over the place. Looking forward to making the trip up to the area. Take a look at the surroundings. Maybe should drive be over to Appleton. Should be winter up there, shouldn't it? Mm -hmm. Kozar is 293 yards on the night, and he's losing by 17. <laughs> but as a youngster, you have to feel that's going to have it down the line. A little slow of foot. You're going to have to protect him. He's not going to do a whole lot scrambling for you, but he's got a gun for an arm. First and goal on what should be the final play of the game. I suppose that's the appropriate way to end it for the Bengals. As their defense does the job, their ground game was scintillating. Kinnebrew was the big star, and Cincinnati goes home with a 30-13 win. Al Michaels and Frank Gifford, and that's the story from Cleveland 
where the Bengals beat the Browns 30 to 13. And this ABC Sports exclusive has been brought to you by Nissan. Test drive the new Nissan hard body trucks at your Nissan dealer. By Miller High Life. Purity you can see, quality you can taste. Miller made the American way since 1855. By the U.S. Army, a place to be all you can be. By AT&T and long distance services, information and network systems, telephones and computers, AT&T is the right choice. Travel arrangements made through a promotional fee paid by United Airlines. United flies more people to Hawaii than any other airline. Nobody knows Hawaii like United. This has been a presentation of ABC Sports, recognized around the world as the leader in sports television. Talk to you Monday.